Season of the Dawn released in December 2019, and it's fondly remembered for its aesthetics, community puzzle, and generally for being a more substantial experience than the previous season. The two lore books we got in this release, Constellations and The Pigeon and the Phoenix, are significant texts. The former gives us the most intimate look at the Traveller's motivations ahead of whatever comes out during the final shape, and the latter significantly fleshes out some major moments in the history of the Last City and the Vanguard itself. I've split this episode into four sections. First, the origins of the Speakers and the Last City. Second, the origins of Saint-14 and Osiris, as well as their actions before the events of Destiny the Game. Third, the period of time where Saint-14 was in the Infinite Forest and when we find him. And finally, the seasonal story itself. There are timestamps and a full list of all the entries used in the description below. I hope you enjoy. The Dawn of the Last City, covering the first half or so of the book Constellations. Constellations. Dreaming. You are the first to dream. In the dream, you are shaping coarse sand with your hands. You lift a handful, and it feels like the shifting of mountains. You drag your fingertip through the dirt to make a twisting line, and hear the roar of moving water. You breathe, and feel the rush of clean, bright wind in your hair. Suddenly, you are far, far, far up in the air, higher than you've ever been. You have gone to the very top of Freehold's tallest skyscrapers, but this is much higher and you see the world below with much greater fidelity. It is a beautiful green world, much greener than any place you've ever seen before. It looks like home. I am the first to dream. The dreams can happen at any time. A veil drops in front of my eyes and I see strange, moving images. I am someone else or am myself reimagined? I can't say. In the dreams, I shape planets with my own hands. At first, I believe I am mad. The clinicians at Braywell call it interplanetary relocation maladjustment psychosis. A psychobabble catch-all term for mental disturbances that they can't explain. Other people searching for certainty, call it prophecy. But all I can offer is a loose, tangled connection that I painstakingly unravel when I dream. I am drawn to a bright and attentive star. I speak to it through movement, through feeling. It understands implicitly. Now, I stand before a crowd. Their murmuring is the bone-deep rumble of shifting tectonic plates. A screen behind me plays looping, blurry footage of the Traveller terraforming Venus. The images radiate with pale light. We've watched this footage many times. I glide through space as if through water, tugged in nine directions by nine impulses. In front of the crowd, I sway a little, a copse of trees bending in a dream wind. I can't help it. I'm dreaming more often than not. There is a whispering from the deep, dark, alluring and terrifying. A reminder of things left behind. It's a sweet and abhorrent. A crackle of static on the screen behind me brings me back to Earth, resettling my feet firmly on the ground. These people have come here for my insights. I lean forward and speak to the crowd. Four tenets, aching with truth. The Traveller is a force of benevolence. The Traveller is a sentient being with free will, dreams, hopes, and fears. 
The Traveller will save us. The Traveller will leave us. Severing. You feel it before it happens. It has happened before. You feel deep in your bones that this thing has chased you across galaxies like an unshakable dread. It strives to undo. It will undo you. It will undo all of us. First is suffocation and then pain. The pain isn't localized to any part of you, but to all of you and beyond you. You want to run, but you are pulled in all directions by opposite and equal forces that hold you perfectly still. It is inescapable this time. You are losing everything that you were. You are bleeding silver into the air like the air is water, and you watch your silver blood float away from your body. Empty. 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 I am the speaker who witnesses the end of the world. Through it all, I am overwhelmed by torrents of sharp, static images, sometimes so fast and constant that I can't see or hear. The Traveller is babbling, telling me everything and nothing all at once in fast, stereoscopic waking nightmares. I am myself and not myself. And I... And stuck in a web of black spider silk, frozen in the mind-numbing silence of space, have no answers. The fall isn't quick. It happens over weeks and months. Cataclysmic disasters, natural and unnatural, flattening human settlements on every planet that I have made, I have shaped, my work laid flat. Earthquakes, tidal waves, Solar flares, cyclones, sinkholes, exploding lakes, wildfires, unknown, untreatable plagues raise populations in hours. Water goes black with unknown poisons forced down my throat. The ground opens up and swallows entire cities. And I am sick, sick, sick. This has happened before. I'd watched in my dreams the cities that fell. Alien cities, torn down by a wind so fierce that it flattened an entire world. And it is not my fault. But this is different. The Traveller has not left us. Something new, half remember and wish forgotten, this false sister has arrived. I don't want to abandon you. Watch on crackling video feeds as people try to escape the outer planets. Exodus ships burn, like I will burn, up with thousands upon thousands of souls aboard. We gather in frightened, huddled, trapped, stuck, doomed groups in relief outposts hoping against hope. I try to aid the relief effort, but my thoughts run. become more and more scattered. I can't run. keep separate my own mind run. and the run. 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 travelers. Then, suddenly, silence. And it's the silence that truly breaks me. Waking. I am the first speaker to see a ghost. The way we tell it, after the collapse, the traveller cut itself into a thousand tiny pieces and sent them out into the world. These tiny pieces are drawn to me, and to others like me, like moths. The first time I saw them, I thought they were surveillance drones. But up close, they were nothing like our old technology. Not really. The way they move seems organic and natural. 
They spin their shells like they are ruffling feathers. Their little forward-facing lights blink like eyes. We're called ghosts, one of them said to me once, hovering at my shoulder as I tended a cook fire. Why? I asked, gentle, casual. They're all different, these ghosts. Most of them are like children, curious and friendly. Some are world-weary from the moment they're born. The ghost spun his silver petals, considering. Because we're searching, I think. It's a good enough answer for me. I'm searching too. I let the little ghosts follow me. We talk about what the Traveller was like before the collapse. They like to hear it. And I like to remember. Deep in their core, they remember too, I think. They remember a time when they were all one piece. Still, they like to ask what the Traveller told me, and I recount all the dreams I can still remember. I haven't dreamed since the collapse, and this is almost, almost, almost like dreaming again. Today, at twilight, one of the shy and quiet ghosts, who has been lingering at my side, asks if I will follow her out into the valley. I should say no. But she sounds hopeful, and I'm curious. We travel for several hours. The land here is recovering, not just from the collapse, but from the time before it. Resources for our settlement are scarce, but nature is creeping back in. And nature is cruel now. It's been starving and confused for decades, jostled out of its natural order, and now we reap the consequences. Wolves steal our livestock. Mange-ridden bears wander through our compound late at night, pouring out our doors. The land is so thick with the memory of poison that it won't grow crops. We protect ourselves from this recovering world as best we can, and we rarely go out at night. But I'm drawn by a curiosity that feels beyond me. The ghost leads me to a barn with a sagging roof. She asks me to wait out of sight. She says, I think you'll scare her. I don't fully understand what she means. I crouch and watch as she hovers over the years old remains of a person, barely recognisable as something that was once living. The ghost floats over the body nervously and then scans it with pale light. In front of my eyes, flesh grows over old bones, and tattered rags stitch themselves together. The person, a woman, gasps and sits up. I can't believe it. The ghost hovers close to her new companion and says something quiet and reassuring. I can't hear. I feel amazed, and then jealous, and then ashamed. Longing. I am the first speaker to be taken prisoner. The greatest surprise isn't being captured. It's being captured by a dreg. In the end, when they drag me, tied and bound, into a damp cave miles out from my settlement, it's three dregs. I look around for a kel or a priest, someone in charge, but we're alone. There are no pikes or ether tanks, no banners, no servitors. I sit on a rock and look at my captors, more perplexed than afraid. The shame of being captured by something so little and young looking, when for so long we've managed to defend our settlement from their hulking captains, is a little bit humbling. The drag who grabbed me fidgets with a mask, one of his companions watches while the other half-heartedly points an arc spear at me. They seem uncertain, nervous. Probably they weren't supposed to have done this. I wait patiently until the dreg straps the mask to his face. You, he says in a crackling, distorted voice. I'm flawed, 
they've managed to make a translator. You are the mouth of the great machine? There have been negotiations with the Fawn since they've arrived on Earth. Never successful, nearly always fatal, but they've happened. So I'm aware that some of the Risen know their alien language, and some of the high-level Fallen know ours. Dregs, though, that's another surprise. And the mouth of the great machine. Hmm. I was, I say carefully. The dreg narrows all four of his eyes as his tech translates my words. If he understands the distinction between I am and I was, he doesn't show it. Instead, he nods. You will tell us the great machine's words? It doesn't actually sound like a command. I wonder if, with better translation tech, he would have said please. I don't say anything. If I reveal what I can't do, what I don't know, they'll probably kill me. The other two dregs gather around their companion, watching him eagerly. Now and then they look at me. The one holding the spear has let her grip grow slack, and the spear is tipped down to point at the ground. The fallen have surprisingly expressive faces. What I pick up from them is not aggression or hatred, but fearful anticipation. The dreg with the mask nods again, not discouraged by my silence. This time, when he speaks, I can hear his hope even through the mask. Why did the great machine leave us? I stare back at him. Any fear I felt before dissipates. Instead, what I feel is a grief partially forgotten in the chaos of trying to survive, and a deep and abiding kinship with the enemies who have pursued us. My voice is very quiet when I finally speak. I don't know. The other two dregs look at their friend waiting. His expression twists with confusion, and then disappointment. There's anger there, too, but it's overpowered by something else. A very familiar sorrow. We sit in silence for a long time. Singing. I am the first speaker to never dream. At least, I think that's true. In the days following the collapse, any speakers who survived were scattered to the wind, travelling with groups of refugees across the ruined wasteland that Earth became. Aside from the man who taught me, I've never met another speaker in my life. For all I know, I'm the last one alive. Before the collapse, speakers were chosen for their ability to hear the traveller through detailed, lucid dreams. Since the dreams have stopped, there are other signs. Ghosts follow us. When we do dream, we see a strange and blinding white light. We are prone to headaches. My mentor couldn't teach me how to interpret dreams, so he taught me in hypotheticals. I had to imagine what the dreams might be like. I had to speculate why the Traveller might come back to us and when. Like all speakers, I memorised the four tenets. The Traveller is good. The Traveller is sentient. The Traveller will save us. The Traveller will leave us. Sometimes I worry the Traveller has already left us. My mentor died of a wasting sickness two years ago, and I've tried to live as his replacement. But where he was a living memory of when the Traveller was awake, I have only his memories, second-hand, imperfectly understood, and I can't give answers. I can't make the Traveller speak. Or, at least, I couldn't. For weeks, I have worked in secret on a project gathering scrap metal and old broken things left over from the time before. I've 
cobbled it together, tinkered with the mix of strange and half-understood technology, tried to calibrate it to my needs. A long time ago, long before the collapse, astrophysicists recorded sounds from the planets in our solar system and turned them into music. They translated plasma waves and radio emissions into eerie musical rumbles, roars, whistles and hisses. The Traveller makes sounds too. Speakers have listened to its music for many years in the form of dreams. Carefully, lovingly, I build a mask, an amplifier. No one knows about it but me. I won't get their hopes up, even though mine are sky high as I put the finishing touches on it. It's not beautiful like our old technology was. It's scuffed and bent and rusted, like everything we own now. But if I'm right, if I can do this, it will do beautiful things. I can't bear to fail. I've failed at everything else so far. When I'm finished, I wear the mask. Pieces of it, not sanded down, are rough and sharp against my face. But I dream for the first time in my life. I have cried out unheard for so long that my voice is raw. Building. You are the last remaining star. In your dreams, you see yourself suspended in bright but flickering light, staring out over a world half destroyed. You see thousands of pieces of yourself in that world, stumbling through it like infants, wandering in labyrinthine ruins they don't understand. For a moment, you feel in your body everything that they feel. The elation of success. The pain of failure, the candle snuff of death, the gasping of rebirth, you feel it all at once. I am the last speaker. I am the child of two self-exiles, and I live in a settlement in the shadow of a looming mountain. There are about three hundred of us, and we've lived here for nearly seven years. When we first arrived, we were under the jurisdiction of a warlord named Kathal. He offered us protection for a high price, requisitioning a third of our supplies and conscripting nearly half of our people to his cause. The actual protection he provided was limited. The warlords used our valley like a battlefield, crashing through like giants who couldn't see the lives they were ending. But they could. They saw us. They just didn't care. The Iron Lord drove Cathal out nearly a year ago, and we've lived in comfortable independence since then, with little oversight from our risen saviours. Our people voted for that. The Iron Lord saved us, but they would be no different from the Warlords if they also wished to rule us. Now, I sit in negotiations with one of them, a woman named Lady Ephrodite. You're free to decide either way, she says. But if you say yes, you'll have an armed escort. Three other people sit with me. Our elected mayor, our most experienced physician, and our oldest resident. We are the people our settlement chose as representation. Beside me, a silver ghost spins his shell, floating at my shoulder, watching Ephrodite. He's followed me for over a year now, and still hasn't found his chosen. He's good company. I have given so much of myself already, but I give more. I become a beacon. I call my children home. A consolidated population like that, all in one place? Our mayor says. She sounds weary. She's been in her position for nearly 60 years. It would draw warlords to us like flies. Don't worry about the warlords, Ephrodite says, with the cool assurance of someone who only half understands our worry to begin with. Their days are numbered. Their way of life is incompatible with the Iron Decree. 
And so, she shrugs. Her nonchalance is unrelatable, but I think I trust her. I trust the Iron Lords. They've given us little reason to doubt them. How would this city be governed? I ask. Ephrodite shrugs again. That seems like the kind of thing you put to a vote. She taps her fingers on the table, impatient for only a little. We'll just build the place and bring people there. We can defend the walls, but we're not going to dictate what happens inside them. This is a joint venture. A collaboration. My companions exchange looks, considering. Ephrodite watches us. Like most of the Risen, she tries to look impassive. Unaffected. But if you listen closely, she's trying to convince us. She wants this. Listen, she says. Risen and non-Risen have lived in their separate corners for too long. We're all people. That's all the Iron Lords are trying to say. We should live together. She pauses. There are things we can teach each other. Two weeks later, once we've packed up everything we can carry, we leave for the place where we'll build the last safe city of Earth. I wish for something to grow in my shadow. The Rise and Fall of Osiris, covering the law book The Pigeon and the Phoenix, the other half of Constellations, the Web Law, the Accolade, and Vanguard Commander, the Exotic, the Bombardiers, and a few Destiny 1 and pre Shadow Keep entries. The Pigeon and the Phoenix, Burden. Part 1. A lone engine rails against the faux tranquility of the dead zone, keeping a teetering chassis of metal just within the terminator line of brimming twilight. The carrier dives through needled mountains that perforate low-hanging clouds, cutting them into sheets of stratus and vapour that slide like flattening suds across a dusk ocean. A closed net comms line crackles. Most of the canopy is too thick to land. We'll be exposed in the clearing. She will be there. Final transmission lists six refugees, peddled for ether, and upward of thirty fallen. In that case, I'm glad we brought the machine gun. This warlord who deals with them. We will have to pay them a visit. Focus on the task at hand. Thirty seconds. Uh, Miss Luzine's ghost. Ghost. Reports no pikes. However, there is a covered pit in the camp that drew curiosity. They are going radio silent. Something better left alone, I'm sure. They plunge into shadow, between peaks, cloud wake trails as they slow to land. The carrier whirs and rattles. Engines cut and cool. Titan and Warlock disembark. They wait. Well done, Geppetto. Marin Uro's voice emanates from his helmet. Visor stiffly fixed on the tree line. Geppetto blinks code into the gloaming horizon, awaiting response. Thank you, Brother Marin. It was my first time. Marin is a statue. Saint opens the carrier's cargo hold and turns to Marin. She will be here. Geppetto blinks. No response from Miss Luzine. All this worry. It is over nothing. Ty will laugh with us tomorrow. Saint pats Marin's back. Tomorrow. Marin's eyes are fixed on the darkening tree line. Yes, tomorrow. The day after, again after that, and more until a day without armour. That's a pleasant thought. Marin straightens, peering at a point in the depth. A light blinks from the tree line. Brother Saint, I have located them. Burden. Part 2. Ty of Lucene leaves the tree line with six souls in tow. She spots Geppetto's light flickering in the twilight. Her ghost, ghost, spins and shimmers in the hands of a child who is navigating them to their destination. Moonlight creeps into the valley, 
lifting the arrested momentary pitch between sundown and moonrise. Dew hugs the grass along her boots. They approach. Ghosts dissipate. Marin stands, poised. A long barrel armament affixed with a bipod adorns his shoulders. Thank you for doing this, Marin. Tive speaks softly. She thrusts a steady hand towards his. He nods and shakes her hand. It was Saint's idea. Is that what he told you? She looks to Saint, greeting refugees and ushering them into the carrier. It does not matter who had the idea. Saint-14 hugs her. Marin straightens and looks beyond them. Flares loose from the canopy, breathing pale azure revival back into the sky. Shrieks and lights whiff into frenzy within the trees. Cloud cover casts darkness over the clearing. Marin's stance breaks. Tive, get this heap in the air. Saint, you're with me. Marin plants a bipod in the grass. Saint spreads his light into a gleaming barricade in opposition against the tree line. Go now. It's a long flight. We will make sure you are not followed. Saint shoulders his rifle. Tive nods. She runs for the cockpit. Saint salutes as the cargo hold shuts. Howls ring from the brink. Fallen step into the clearing. Marin racks the repeater. Come on then. The carrier engine fires. It roars, bright, bellowing flame. A beacon. A wish. Cacophony sounds in the distance, splitting heated bends through the canopy pine as a screaming red shell tears across the clearing. The carrier is annihilated. Tive shatters. Her body skids across the grass in ruin. Deafening shock breaks the night. In it, one lone call. Spider tank. Burden, part three. Saint looks to the twisted scar where the carrier had been. They are gone. Suppressing fire. Marin sends their response clear into the tree line. The fallen charge against his lead rebuke. Move. Saint catches sight of Tive, newly breathing. She stumbles several paces away, posture crooked among the wreckage. She leans against a shard of the carrier's hull, out of sight while a ghost busily spins light. The hand of her good arm sinks to a sheathed blade. The night air hangs still. The exo's eyes lock to the tree line. His will, solid iridescence. The air around him bends into infinite density. Violet shimmer ripples across his plate and bows outward against the horror, consolidating into a luminous shield. He meets the fallen charge with void like doom. Machine gun fire rips overhead, cutting down dregs and splitting the front in two. He takes ground with every step, shattering each challenger. He breaks through to the tree line and flings his shield, severing one of the walker's limbs. He is at the brink, face to face with death. The walker's field gun teeters to match his verticality. Saint-14 braces. He is an incandescent ward. A just retribution. A violet wall that stands to refute the night. But the dawn does not follow. A second shell rings from the walker's cavern. It collides apocalyptic. The ward shatters against the blast. Only darkness. A steel hand. Limp and flat slowly clenches into a fist. They are dragged. Saint grasps at consciousness. His vision is fire and wreckage. Timbers shatter against the walker's frame as it emerges before them, shrouded behind smoke. Fallen mouths shriek in muted death tone emptiness as they fill the clearing. Saint blinks. The world races back to him. The remaining fallen ranks part to reveal a hulking captain. Chitters and Trill runs from the vandals down to the dregs as he roars. Marin is at his back, breathing and bleeding. Faster, Tive. The Horde raise their arms. They unleash a storm of bolts. Tive meets the bolts in the air, crackling with lightning that snaps at the ground beneath her. She whisks away the storm with a keen to discipline, scattering a hail of arc bolts around the fire team. Dirt hisses as the bolts sear into the ground, 
and billow clouds into the air. She slides into the obfuscating dust and sweeps Arc Purity through the fallen in the confusion. Marin takes the distraction. He distillates all his will, all the light he can muster into one point. Colour drains around him, and the point grows dark. He casts it from him, a pale iridescence that rips reality endlessly into itself. The sphere of void strikes the walker true, twisting the crumpling metal into oblivion. Not one fallen remains. They stand alone in the wreckage. Moths to Flame, Part 1 Cinder's spit, watching faint light over Cyrus's lone face. The woods behind him formlessly melt into midnight nothing. Sagira moves across his shoulders. Distant serenity. She is a small diamond, instilled isolation. A playful flitter blinking among thermal plume. Pensive focus sloughs the physical. He is alone in the void. Intrusions no more. There is a point in the depth, cannot be directly viewed, delve, dive, deeper. The fire is going out, cloying worldly noise rushes back. Hmm, aren't you cold? I wasn't. Osiris rubs his brow and stirs the fire. Thank you, Sagira. It's not going to get any clearer just because you want it to, Osiris. You need time. Osiris clenches his jaw. He feels himself standing in wide shallows gaping at an unrecognisable profundity. Why did you choose me? Osiris's voice is hollow. He flattens a palm for Sagira to perch. You have a spark. Her voice is warm air. The fire pops. A spark? Frustration lines his face. This world is dying. Over and over again. So were you. I dragged you back. Sagira allows Osiris's hand to cradle her shell. I raised you until you could stand on your own. You'll do the same for them, in your own way. Her words linger in his ears, with sweetness. I don't have your patience, Sagira. He takes in a slow breath and lets it out. Someone's coming, her voice sharp. Conceal me, his serene. Sagira dissipates as Osiris closes his palm. He dims. Moths to Flame, Part 2 A small band of humans emerge from the woods at Osiris' flank. Some carry rust-laden firearms. The one who leads them jaunts forward. Stand up, old man. The words are slung over his shoulder, wet and heavy. No. A painted ghost whips in front of Osiris' face. Warlord Reich demands you stand. You're on my turf, burning my wood. That's stealing. That's an arm. Given immortality and all you can think to do is grab at what's around you. What a waste. The warlord laughs. The ghost quickly laughs in step. You're a disgrace. Osiris peers over his shoulder. Leave. Rethink your path. It's your arm or your life. Those are the rules. Make your decision. Osiris leaves the words to hang around the warlord's head. I have half a dozen guns up my back. The warlord puts pitted iron to Osiris's hood. I have a spark. Flame engulfs Osiris, erupting into wings that cast back the shadows of the night. A white hot blade extends from his hand. In one swift motion, Osiris cuts the warlord down into a sizzling heap and snatches his stunned ghost from the air. His gaze shifts to the people to catch sight of their backs as the lot retreat into the woods. His attention snaps to the ghost. Why this man? Osiris douses his flame. Get off me! Sagira compiles herself back into existence. You, sister, help! Okay, hey. He's not going to hurt you. Talk to me. Pretend like he's not here. Sagira aligns herself directly in front of the ghost. Their irises lock and twitch erratically in sequence. Oh, let him go. 
Osiris releases. The ghost dissipates. Sagira, he needed someone strong. A fighter, nothing more. Sagira pauses. The Traveler was wounded when it created us. That pain echoes. Some of us make choices we shouldn't. Some of us are scared. The process isn't streamlined. Flaws. Osiris shrinks against the forests of photic density. If there are flaws in the light, then it could be corrupted. It is not indomitable, and so in time, would be challenged. We're pieces of a whole, but distinct. Unique. You're not Mr. Perfect yourself. He would need to learn patience. Where will he go? To reunite with the Traveller. To find someone new. Someone better. Foundations. Part 1. What would be the last city? Looms over Osiris. Ramshackle barricades bend around it miles into the distance. He strides through half-formed steel rust walls and across flattened earth foundations pocked from small arms fire. He passes dozens of citizens welding fortifications, making repairs, and dissembling thin, battle-scorched hovels to repurpose the materials into permanent homes. Light bearers dot the landscape, heaving great loads of metal to the burgeoning walls, melting beams together with solar light, or scanning for distant threats all along the many watchtowers that border the city like lighthouses, guiding the lost into safe harbour. Ghosts project diagrams and schematics to steer the hands of each worker, one man pulls a crude cup from a bucket. It drips clean water as he lifts it to his lips and drinks deeply, while the bucket is ferried away on pulleys to quench another group elsewhere. I've never seen so many ghosts before. Will we be staying long? The Traveller is here, Sagira. Where better to find the answers we seek? The smell of tea and spice flow through the air, bouncing punctually to the senses over aging smoke and fumes. An aroma of peppered meats draws Osiris toward a central square, full of scattered materials and low cinder chunk walls propping up scrapyard rifles. An armoured exo shuffles between cooking grills inside a ring of rubble. It sounded grander, Sagira muses, surveying the tent city remnants in the distance. Rumours always do. It's not quite the foothold oasis Bellwinter spoke of, but it is a start. What could be grander? The exo-chef clatters half a dozen wooden plates of food onto a rough stone counter. This is hope, Guardian. Quiet days like these. Soon there will be more. I'm no Guardian. Just meeting a friend. Osiris looks to a far tower jutting above the encompassing construction, solitary, in the shadow of an osseous white orb. I will be your friend. Come, sit, eat. There is enough for you to join us. I am Saint Fourteen. Osiris eyes the plated meat and the smoky grill before glancing back at the distant fortifications. You could do the work of twenty on that wall. It is their wall. Should they require assistance, they need only ask. Saint Fourteen extends a plate of food towards Osiris and arranges his faceplates into a smile. Since he's not going to introduce us, this is Osiris. I'm Sagira. It's nice to meet you, Saint. Foundations, Part 2 It is nice to meet you too, Sagira. Osiris, please. Saint Fourteen gestures to a flimsy wooden chair. Two ghosts zoom past them and sweep plates from the counter before scooting off. Would you mind helping them bring food to the people, Sagira? Sure, let me just load up my service protocol. The joke hangs. Sane 14 expresses genuine thanks. Okay, I'll be right back. She delicately balances a plate and floats away. Are you not hungry? You could be patrolling with the Iron Lords. Osiris pulls the plate closer. Saint sits. Is that what gives you purpose? A gaggle of ghosts zoom across the ground kicking up tiny clouds and chirping to each other. They glide up the rubble, 
leaving clean plates. Scoop up new ones and are gone again. There are monsters out there. The kind a lightless being could not hope to overcome. Life is hard. Saint stands to line the grill with shaved pork. Those of us who can help should. I worry about wasted potential. Osiris sneaks a small piece from his plate. You should see the speaker. Perhaps he can help you find your path. Osiris scoffs. I don't think he has my answers. You want to bet? Saint-14 flips the mound of pork with his hand. I don't gamble. Osiris pauses. He glances over his shoulder. Sagira twists in formation with the other ghosts. They dance through the air, scooping empty plates from improvised tables. Is he a good man? I would give my life for him. Hmm. All this. Saint-14 gestures to the borders of the city. It is a breath. People are better if they have a moment to breathe. You think so? I do. And I think you will come to see I am right. Ghosts make the loop. Sagira laughs. Maybe. Thank you for the food, Saint-14. You're welcome. The two eat. Osiris's shoulders slacken. Does this taste burnt to you? No. The Bombardiers. Tallulah Fairwind never turns down a dare. Tallulah Fairwind. It's Saint Fourteen's idea more than mine, the speaker said. Tallulah leaned against the wall, her arms tightly crossed. That guy has a lot of ideas, seems like. Would you consider it? She tilted her head to look at the sky, as if imploring the traveller for patience. Listen, she said, and dropped her chin again. Organising all the hunters in the system doesn't make sense. The whole idea of being a hunter is about... She struggled to find the right word. Disorganisation? The speaker supplied dryly. Ha ha. There was no amusement in the laughter. It's about freedom. Independence. You look like a warlock, so you wouldn't understand. The speaker smiled behind his mask. Right, he said. But I've seen you with the others. You've brought other hunters together, and to great effect. The rescue effort you took to old Russia, for instance, or the supply recovery you've been doing with Tab and Venra. There is something to be said about solitary people coming together, working as one. Don't try to make this poetic, Tallulah said. And we're not solitary. Independent doesn't mean solitary. The speaker held up his hand. You're right he said. But if the warlocks have representation in Osiris and the titans in Saint-14, I feel the hunters deserve some as well. And you're a strong candidate. Are there others? Tallulah said, sobering a little. When the speaker shrugged, she straightened her shoulders, then tried to shrug it off as well. I don't know. I'm not sure I have time for logistical stuff. Well... I thought you might be up for the challenge, the speaker said, because it would be a challenge, given your schedule. A daring endeavour, even. Tallulah was suddenly dead serious. So it's a dare, speaker. It might be. Constellations. Growing. You are waiting for something to happen. You are suspended and weightless, but so heavy in your heart. You have a child's voice, quiet, easily lost in a crowd. You try to shout and be heard, but there is only one little star in a sea of thousands that can hear you. It only understands a fraction of your words, but it tries, and that has to be enough. Life goes on beyond your control, as it always has. That is the curse of your creation. The things you build are not your own. And then another star blinks into existence. I am the last speaker, and I sit at a table with the vanguard while the city around us fights over nothing. We've built this city to find some kind of unity, Tallulah says. She has her hands on the table and is leaning forward like she might jump over it. We're breaking apart from the inside. Silence falls over the room. 
I am trying to think. What does the Traveller say? Saint-14 asks, quietly. Everyone looks at me. I breathe in through my nose, breathe out slowly. About the factions? I ask. Or about people killing each other in our streets? This is not what the Traveller wanted. That much I can tell you. That was the direct result of creating us, Osiris says, leaning back in his seat. He is stone-faced, as always. Violence? Does the Traveller truly know what it wants? I try to hide my frustration, and I'm glad my face is hidden by my mask. The truth is, I cannot say for certain what the Traveller wants, or whether it knows what it wants. The Traveller does not speak to me in words, but in dreams. Dream language is cramped. The messages come from the Traveller, disintegrate on their way to me, and reform into something else. I am an interpreter more than a speaker. But uncertainty has been the death of us before, and it will be again if we're not vigilant. So what I say is, the Traveller has always wanted to protect humanity, on its own or through guardians. We need to enact that will. With all due respect to both of you, Tallulah says, eyeing Osiris and me, this isn't about the Traveller. This is about what happens when people come together without anyone to really lead them. She taps her foot. She's nervous. Unusual for Tallulah. Let this go on a little longer, and this is the same as the Dark Age. It's just warlords packed into a tighter pen. A body of representatives would help, St. Fourteen says. Something to allow all sides to be heard. Every side has a voice. But not all voices should be given the same weight, I say, shaking my head. Some of these ideas are dangerous. We should determine which factions can continue to exist, and give them an official channel through which to air their grievances and pursue their needs. Which ideas are dangerous, speaker? Osiris asks. He is watching me, steadily. And who decides that? This is not a fight, Saint-14 says. We have enough of those ahead of us. We will hear from each of the factions, I say, ignoring Osiris. Some decision is better than no decision. Give them the opportunity to plead their case, save for those who have resorted to outright violence. Well then, we've got to get rid of Echelon South, for one, Tallulah lists, counting on her fingers. And those binary star idiots too. Trinary, binary, whatever. Anyway, there are plenty of fingers pointed at this new group too. Monarchy something? If anyone can prove the rumours true, we exile their leaders, I say, holding up my hand. The factions that stay will argue their case. Of those that have a valuable viewpoint to bring to the governance of the city, we create a council. This sets a dangerous precedent, Speaker, Osiris says. We will have this argument again later, I can already tell. I hope you're prepared to walk this slope. We vote. Osiris is the only no. Then, after an inquiry into the violence, we form the consensus. The Accolade, Part 1 Jasmine was nine cycles old. She stared out from the top of a hill across a blasted, ashen landscape. This morning, this had been her village, before the fallen catch and its walkers arrived. Those were equally ruined, reduced to a trio of smouldering metallic husks at the centre of town. But Jasmine was alive, and so were her parents and her neighbours too, thanks to the titan who patrolled the region. That light bearer, a giant in an iron suit, watched curiously as her father tried in vain to smoke a fire into existence. Her mother stared in silence at the burning ash that used to be their home. Together, they were waiting for the rest of the villagers to return with dinner. Local berries, if they were lucky. You should come with me. The light bearer said to the three of them, Humanity must unite. There is a foundation forming under the Traveller. Let me take you there. We would never make it, 
Jaslyn's father growled, fumbling with his bow drill. We can't afford to dream like you can. I would protect you, the Titan said. Jasleen's father ignored him, her mother too. My neighbour says dregs eat children, Jasleen said to break the silence. I've seen it, the Titan replied. I feel sorry for them, the dregs. The Titan looked down at her for a moment, then swept his gaze across the ruin of their lives. What is their suffering compared to yours? You lost everything today. And still, it was a good day as these days go. She craned her neck to look up at him. What do you mean? About what? Why is it a good day? I did not arrive too late to help. I did not die today. Do you worry about dying? She interrupted. I worry about not helping. Have you ever lost a fight? More than I can count. I am no Ikora Ray. No Radagast. Who are they? Guardians. Like me. Jasleen shrugged, her skinny shoulders sharp under her ratty tunic. That's okay. You're my favourite. We remember those who help us. Has anyone ever helped you? He nodded. Yes. Oh yes. Who? The speaker? He thinks for a moment before replying. No. A guardian like me saved me from the fallen when I was young when I had lost everyone I was meant to protect. That guardian is why humanity must go to the Traveller. Jasleen furrowed her brow. What do you mean? That guardian's ghost and light showed me a vision of humanity's potential. The land beneath the Traveller becomes a place of safety. I- The foraging party returned with rabbits. They would eat well tonight. As her mother and father moved to help prepare their dinner, Jasleen undid the bow in her hair and motioned the Guardian to come closer. She wrapped it around the Titan's gauntlet. I think that's going to take a long time, she said. Maybe. He stared down at his arm. On that day, I will bring this with me. What's your name? She asked. Say it, he said. I'll remember it. A woman with gnarled hands and an aged face sat alone on a couch, basking in the dim glow of a golden age ruin. She held back a cough as she eyed ancient monitors on the walls and ceiling, which directed visitors to empty offices belonging to people long dead. It was cold, silent, and dark. The woman felt she should leave, but just outside, through the doors behind her, an acid rainstorm showered the streets of a dead city. She had been travelling for weeks, and today she had eaten the last of the hermetically sealed food from a vending machine she had found a few miles from here. If she could go back, she would. She had taken all that she could carry, but the machine held plenty more. Life in the Golden Age must have been a paradise. Right now, she wasn't hungry, and she felt no fear. It was an odd change of pace. She welcomed the respite. The room stretched on for a hundred metres in front of her, branching into rows and rows of doors that led to who know where. There was enough space in this building to house a thousand families. For a moment, she wished her daughter and her daughter's daughter were still here with her. They had begun their trip together months ago from Varuna, but she had urged them to go on ahead, giving her share of supplies to them. Supplies were heavy, and she was too slow. There were rumours a human settlement was growing under the Traveller, and the Spoken plan was to reunite there. The Spoken plan, at least. She rubbed her hands together to ward off the cold, and she coughed. Immediately, something creaked far down the hall. A door slammed open, followed by the sounds of rapid scuffling. She stood up from her couch and slowly backed away, pulling a plasteel shiv from a sheath strapped to her thigh. Five figures with glowing eyes emerged from the gloom and rushed toward her, brandishing weapons. Two ran like men, massive and four-armed, and two were leaner, crawling low to the ground. The last was small, about the size of a human. It loosed a howl no earthborn mouth could make. She hoped her child and grandchild still lived, and held her weapon up in silent salute. The sliding doors behind her opened with a whoosh, and a violet discus cut through the air above her, 
singing like a sword loosed from its sheath. Three of the creatures dissolved into screaming void as the disc of light caromed down the length of the corridor. As the woman turned to look over her shoulder, an iron monster alight with boiling void energy leapt over her. He moved with a grace that contradicted his size and caught one of the remaining beasts by the neck as it bounded at him. He reeled back and bam, the thing went limp as he smashed its skull with the top of his helm. Its companion lunged with a crackling arc sword, but he stepped forward and kicked its knee out to bring it down to his height. Reeled back and bam, 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 he jackhammered the beast's winged helm with his own. It fell back, dead. The corridor fell silent. He turned and asked quietly, Where do you hail from? Patron, the woman replied. He nodded. Lynn sent me to look for you. The woman scoffed and sheathed her weapon. She was supposed to go to the Traveller. She made it. All the way, he replied. They both did. He raised his armoured hand, wrapped tight with a purple cloth, and keyed a switch on his helmet. Jump ship will be here shortly. We'll get you home. Who gave you that ribbon? An old friend. Probably about your age now. How long do you people live? We don't know. The woman stared at him, then tore a piece from her lavender-coloured sleeve. She stepped forward and tied it to a hinge on his pauldron. What is this? Your friend is clever. If I leave this with you, I'll live forever. He chuckled. She did not. Make a mark on this world, she said. Don't waste the time you have. Yes, ma'am, he replied. They were quiet a moment. None of this bothers you? He asked, gesturing at the bodies and the raging storm outside. Everything bothers me, she said, sitting back down on the couch. What was your name again? May. I will remember it. They listened to the rain as they waited. Three children, two awoken girls and a human boy, slept against a rampart on the city wall. They were standing in for their parents, members of the city volunteer militia. They weren't old enough to carry weapons, but the boy clutched a remote access switch that would alert every guard in the district. He would need to be awake to trigger it, though. So Saint-14 stood watch in their stead. He would leave when his patrol cycle began in the morning. The children woke when the sun broke the horizon. They pretended not to see him. But when one of the girls tore her handkerchief in two and tied one half to the titan's pauldron, the other two did the same with scraps of cloth and fabric. He asked for their names, but they weren't supposed to give their names to strangers, and all parted amicably. The titan leapt atop the smouldering wreckage of a kip-bashed airship, a stripped-down Arcadia class incapable of escaping orbit, and tore the Golden Age polymer canopy right off the cockpit. He pulled a startled awoken from out of the pilot's cabin as the airship's remaining engine crackled and roared. With the awoken in his arms, the guardian tumbled deftly off the Arcadian airframe and took off at full speed away from the wreckage. The shock cannon that tore the ship out of the sky had started an arc reaction in the engine power cells that would. The shockwave overtook him and tossed him into the air. He rolled to his feet as he landed, dropping the pilot as a dome of light snapped into being around them. A sleet of debris and shrapnel rolled across the titan's ward of dawn. As the metal rain faded, so did the guardian's light. The two stood up. The titan pulled a Daystar SMG2 from a black holster, checked to see if it was loaded, and handed it to the Awoken. You are lucky. The Fallen shot you down twenty miles from the Traveller. They will not bother you again. Head due south, he pointed and turned to leave. But the pilot tapped his shoulder guard. Yes? The pilot untied a bandana on his arm and held out the strip of plum-coloured cloth. You're joking. I have nothing else to give, the pilot said. That ship was my life. The titan stared down at the man. You've found a new life. Go to the Traveller. It's bad luck to not give Saint-14 his due. Saint grasped the cloth. What is your name? Georges, the pilot replied. Saint turned back towards the desert. I will remember it.
observer effect. Saint-14 barrels through drifting wool tufts, dyed in now dispersed polychromatic patterns. A detachment of the firebreak order had overextended their hold in the valley and, when pressed, refused to give ground. Their valiance was swept away in futility. Eight damned, one missing. He emerges at a ridge top on the western border, ribbons of wool still clinging to his armour like kaleidoscopic streaks. Munitions detonate against the open sky behind him. Lightning crashes down in response. The city is not lost yet. Eight guardians lay lightless, their bodies back to back in a field of broken enemies and scorched earth. Fallen circle them like vultures. In the chaos, their ghosts had fled toward the ridgetop without detection. Saint-14 watches them glide, fast and low. He maps the route up the sloped ridge towards a small crater at the lip where he could meet them. His attention snaps to the crater. The ninth, Elric. She was safe and alone and burrowed into herself. Saint slides into the crater next to Elric. Her surprised terror fades to relief. Are you okay? Yes, her ghost is wounded, but alive. We will clear a path, and they will all stand again. The air bursts open above the fallen. Those closest are incinerated. In their place shines Osiris's brilliant golden light. The blast ruptures a nearby captain's barrier, sending them careening across the dirt. Hissing and roars erupt. Shock rifles sling bolts skyward. Flame rains and scatters them. His movements cut orate ribbons through their ranks. Disorientation turns to panic and one after another are consumed by his conflagration. Give them hell, you crazy bastard. Saint turns to Elric. Are you ready? I can't. Osiris cheats his sight to the fleeing ghost for a moment. They had almost made the ridge. Click. He spun back, palm alight. Click. The captain, now standing, sends the full fury of his scorch cannon. The blast rips through Osiris' image in shimmering fashion, scattering light across the valley, traced in molten glass. More fallen flood the valley. We need you, Titan. I can't die again. Then we will not die. Saint checks his magazine. Several tiny lights blip over the lip of the ridge. Guardians. She sits up, counts them all. Eight lies. Eight that would carry so many more. I couldn't. This is a new choice. Saint-14 steps out of the crater. You are only what you want to be. Elric stands. Hide now, little ones. We're going to get your guardians back. Thin, Osiris burns, a roaring visage against a sky-soot firmament. Compressing, endless night, skeins of light twist and hum, charged sinew stitch through his muscle and bone. Myriad, shimmering gold marionettes scramble to reinforce gaps across the city's defence at his behest. The east below him, breached by waves of frenetic, clamouring fallen. The front had not broken only moved. He focuses his projections there. A small fire team holds the line. Osiris twists. Golden Defiance moves to stanch the fallen's momentum. One projection locks eyes with a titan. She nods, and with fluid elegance, the projection lifts her skyward. She brings down a tempest that rolls thunder across the city walls and scatters the advancing force. Shax bellows in the distance. Multiple skeins snap. The sky stretches into starless night. An oblivion crowds the borders of Osiris' mind in suffocating omnipresence. The margins. Light thinly stretched. Under duress. Never enough. The west is bending. The transfer instantaneous. Osiris weaves inferno. Ether and flame engulfing each other into ashen wake. He spots eight lights climbing the ridge. Click. A lone guardian crashes onto the ridgetop horizon. Click. 
They will survive. Click. He turns. Palms are like the north is bending. Nerves burn. The city's golden hue falters. Only a moment of exhalation. The north fractures. Field guns rip into the wall. He is there. Two hunters hold. One snap fires beams of sunlight from her rifle, wreathed in flame. The second dances through challenges, her blades arc purity. None would pass them. His projections move to fill the gap. Bodies in the rubble. Evacuees from the eastern breach caught in the blast. Their deaths filled his mind through twenty gilded eyes, capturing the scene in its totality. Osiris would scour the northern front in golden light. He looked to the shattered wall. Through the gap, mind inutile, overshadowed by the eternal precipice. Crowded with menace. Eyes peering down, seeping over, hungry, waiting to flood this last hope with plunging depth. Even now, as fallen lines break against the light, others stand watching from deep starless hollows. If not this, another. The dam will fail, as all do in time. But for now, the south bends, and it can still be cleansed with fire. War Stories Comms frequency no longer jammed. Re-establishing. Hello, Upcom. Welcome to This is Shax. The enemy is in full retreat. The northern walls stand. I am needed. Shax. Hello? Western fronts are clear. This is Saint-14. Amazing! Then we march on the south. The fallen southern approach is broken. The city holds. Silence hangs for but a moment. They thought they were going to crash in here and kill all of us. The group laughs. Yes. All fire teams accounted for. No casualties. Thanks to you and my friend Elric. You should have seen her. She saved eight little lights. Charged dozens of fallen with me. Lightning, bullets. It was quite impressive. You're too kind. It was an honor to fight by your side. Dozens? I'm impressed, Saint. How many deaths did your charge cost you? I did not die. Elric provided wonderful covering for- I don't believe you! Is that because you died, Shax? I heard the Fallen broke your horn. Where did you hear that? I can vouch for Saint. We didn't die. Saint bursts out laughing. If only we could all be more like you, Saint. As I said, I had excellent cover. I don't know how many times I died. I witnessed the battle through the eyes of the city, balanced on a wire. We were spread thin. My brother, you have fought hard. You should be proud. Without you, we would have been lost. Some were. Vanguard Commander Osiris and Saint stood on a tower platform overlooking one of the six paths into the city. The road beyond the wall still burned with scorching pits of blue flame. Vanguard Commander Saint-14, said Osiris. What a ludicrous title. The consensus wants a new leader in the wake of... of all of this, Saint replied. He shook his head as he gestured at the destruction beyond the city limits. It's time. You'll serve them well, Osiris replied, manipulating a cube-shaped device into an array of smaller hexahedrons that floated between his fingers. Vex components, Saint thought. But I'm afraid it's not a title I can keep, Osiris looked up. Father has plans for me, Saint continued. Giving up on commandership in one day? That's a record. So go. Be a titan for the speaker. After this madness, they will need you to rebuild. I put the titan aside for this mission. I am a soldier. There is difficult work to be done. Osiris narrowed his eyes. What has he asked you to do this time? Take the fight to the fallen. Seek them out beyond our borders. 
Find them wherever they are. Strike first and hard. This is precisely what I mean when I say the speaker likes to lead you astray. Osiris muttered to his cubes. You would not say that if you saw what the Fallen have done to our people out there. You've forgotten how to see. The Fallen are not so different from us. How hard would you fight if the light were taken from you? Those stories ring false to me, said Saint. They are not a noble people. I fought them, and so have you. I have not fought them all, the warlock replied, pulling his hands apart to create an intricate web of hovering cubes and points of light. They are nothing, no threat, not like the Vex, not like the Darkness. Saint stepped close enough to breathe on Osiris. Look past the wall, brother. Are you blind? Osiris folded the device into his palm and met the titan's gaze. You know I'm the only one watching the whole canvas. But you've lost sight of why we fight. Osiris turned away and tossed the cubes again to form a miniature constellation in the twilight sky. As ex-commander, you have the power to dictate a replacement, should you choose. Who's it going to be? I have recommended you for the position of vanguard commander. Osiris turned. The cubes hung listless in the air. You want to give me control over the databases? The vaults? Jurisdiction over Owl Sector? Access to the last city grimoire? I want you to protect our people, Saint said. For all our disagreements, you're one of the few who can. The warlock stared at the titan with an unchanging expression. We don't have the resources to do this twice. Saint continued. I fought representatives of every house across this conflict. It was a joint effort to exterminate us. If threat should come to the city ever again, you'll have to fight in my stead. I accept, Osiris said quickly. Breathe. At the perimeter of the Risen Walls, Sectioned off from the rest of the city, tiny farms sprout from war-rich soil and sow green dashes across ploughed patties. Snake-weave vines trellis up war-husk remnants long since abandoned. The weeks since six fronts had left the city in a rare lull. Wildflowers bud in the light of the traveller. The rains would come soon. Loose summer fabrics that dance colours against the sun gave way to textured wool and wrapped layers deeper in hue. Emerald tassels ripple in the wind atop iron poles, creating a wide seed row for tomorrow's festivities. Ikora leads citizens from the city core to partake in the remembrance. Saint lifts the yoke from his shoulders and they smile to each other. He did not expect so many to walk the seed row with them before the festival. He greets each passerby as they enter the grounds. Some shake his hand, some thank him. Some present violet ribbons that lace through his metallic frame. Birds perch on the higher points of the walls. Zavala drives the final tassel poles to form a ward clash circle. Shax stands monolithic over a swarm of children, their entire being transfixed on him as he recounts moments of heroism in theatrical detail. Anna coaxes solar firecrackers into lanterns and sets them at the fore of the seed row for revelers. Osiris is absent, preoccupied with insatiable predilections that drive him to worry. The world had grown around him. Saint watches citizens take their turn through the seed row. Seeds scatter over each of them and the wind carries their lanterns across fields and over the walls fiery glow bursts against the encroaching dusk as the people complete their circuit and return home. Guardians finish preparations and filter to their nightly posts. Activity wanes into stillness. Anyone you want to remember? Anna hands Saint an empty lantern. He turns it in his hands. What will you do when we beat back the darkness? When there is peace? I don't know, she sighs. You ever wonder about the other 13? 
I think about that sometimes. I'm happy with 40. Anna grips his shoulder. Me too, Saint 14. She sprinkles a handful of seeds over him. Make sure you walk the row. It's getting dark, she smiles. Thank you, Anastasia. Anna nods. You know it's Anna, she says, and makes her way back to the city. Saint 14 fills the lantern with void light and walks the row. For Marin, he sits. Pigeons perch on him, picking out seeds. He watches the lantern until he can no longer distinguish it among the stars. Good births. I'm glad you've found a home here. Margins, part one. Osiris sits in the small stone garden beneath the traveller. His attempts at communion, unsuccessful. He had seen the speaker stand here for hours. Ikora had begrudgingly agreed to appear in his place at the remembrance. Her words were stern, but deep down she knows victories have lulled in complacency. There is an imminent, daunting pressure. A noose awaiting a mister. A delicate game. Brazier's cast shadows, distracting shades flickering across his eyes breaking his concentration. Osiris breathes. The stone gardens are endless space. The skyline is raised horizon. Breathe. He is alone in the void. Intrusions no more. There is a point in the depth. It cannot be viewed directly. Delve. Dive. Deeper. Still, only a point in the aphotic depth, the nothing, expansive. Osiris sinks to gain new perspective. The point remains. It is so faint, distant, though he knows he can see the light. His reach stretched thin, clarity in the space between his hand and the point, the osseous white point. Dim now, the omnipresence was. Hungry acknowledgement. Vast. Himself against the enormity. An endless, unfurling midnight. And a lone point. Margins Part 2 I am pleased to see you here. May I sit? He spoke. Cloying noise. The stone garden is present. He is present. The Traveller, a monarch against bleak, crepuscular ink. You may, Osiris stands. Stay, Osiris halts. He turns towards the speaker. The light of the Traveller washes against the bone-white hue of his mask. Is something needed? There is so much activity in the city. I feel it has been too long since we last spoke. Osiris hangs silent. He looks to the Traveller. There is a daunting pressure. What troubles you? The speaker steps toward Osiris. Osiris inhales sharply. You have read my reports? Of course. The speaker loosens his posture. I value your counsel. We were so close. A moment in the wrong place. Osiris looks to the speaker. The speaker nods, yes, but the light guided your path, a noose awaiting a mister. I did not see the Traveller on the six fronts, the Traveller dwarfs Osiris. But you did, my son. It was in the fire that saved your brothers and sisters. It was in the arc bolts that ripped through their armies, the violet shields that held the line do not romanticise this burden. We wield a weapon. The speaker shakes his head. The light wields you, Osiris. You are what you make of it. A glorious extension of its majesty in many directions. Osiris paces at cadence with his words. Then it would do well to speak clearly, to better direct me. The speaker cocks his head. Without will? 
then it would be no better than the darkness. I am asking only for guidance. It is a delicate game we are playing, Osiris's voice, distressed. Regal again, the speaker motions to the stone garden. Will you sit with me? Patron. Stone laid roads lead Saint Fourteen through the city. He walks them most days when he is home, when time permits. The people wave. They cheer. They bring offerings of their support and adoration. Breads, tokens, wonderfully spun tassels of bands of royal purple hue. His name had become synonymous with the Guardians, an image to be adhered to, to be revered. He smiles and shakes their hands. He smiles and accepts their gifts. Their joy is his. He feels the weight of their royal ribbons around his neck, drawn tight by expectation. His armour is faith. It slips and loosens in transit. They sing together. He shares bread with the chorus of voices. He ties ribbons in their hair. His joy is theirs. They sing him a new song. Their voices shine bright. Shepherd. Father and son stand atop the tower. The city blooms as they watch, radiating outward into a lively sprawl beneath the traveller. Six fronts was a rallying cry, ringing out to call humanity to its next great cause. Thousands made their way to the last city's gates, looking for credence to the many promises their hope had whispered during dead, long nights. Did you imagine it would be like this when we first arrived? Saint-14 leans against the tower railing. The speaker looks over the bustling city streets, not in so little time, but I always believed we were capable. Do you remember when I first awoke? I do. You told me I would be an example for others to follow. How did you know this? I didn't know. I believed in your potential. The Traveller dominates. A wash of blue beams of light cascade across its surface into a twinkling dome against the lonesome, far-off mountains. I often think of the choices we make, whether they are the right ones, whether those we have lost would agree. I try to honour their memories. We are fragile beings, exos as well. It is good to question, to look within yourself. He grips St. Fourteen's shoulders and pulls his stance straight. While I cannot begin to know the sacrifices you have made for us, I can tell you that loss is part of life's sweetness. St. nods. It has taught me many lessons. He raises his head. They watch the city shift and flow. What will you do when we have won? And the speaker patiently stitches the words together in his mind. Geppetto and I searched many barren miles before we crossed the Cosmodrome. She had almost given up hope. He turns to face Saint-14. That little light knew exactly where to find you, once she was given the proper place to look. The speaker chuckles. There is no before or after, my son. We try, we doubt, we grow. It is all one path. Politics. Osiris, I'm sorry. Ikora cannot assume your role. Ikora, leave, please. She turns to him with a keen tone. Is it rude for the subject of the conversation to be present? She may stay if she wishes. She deserves to hear why. The speaker nods to Ikora. She responds, I agree. Fine. Good. Now... Osiris, let her stand before the consensus, Osiris composes himself. She is more than capable of assuming my duties. And, hush now, she's in good hands here. The speaker leans forward. Osiris, 
you cannot be allowed to elect your replacement. It took many conversations for us to reach where we are. The consensus has expectations of the vanguard. There are duties to be met. Speaker, I understand. I call politics. The speaker straightens his posture. Agreements that keep the peace so that we may fight for a future together. Ikora would be my best representative. She is not a replacement. You must be present to perform your duties. Osiris' eyes bore into the speaker's mask. What is my duty if not to protect this city? We are a point in the darkness. We cannot wait for the threats to arrive. Someone has to meet them. The speaker stands. We will, in time, together, Osiris sighs, be patient. A lick of malice bled from the word. The Exile of Osiris. So this is referred to uh, in the season of the uh, Dawn Law, but it's not actually um, part of its story. So it's not included in any of the law books or the cards. This video is incredibly long already. Um, so I've made the decision to not also include the entire story of his exile. There's a comic you can read online that goes into this. But as like a short summary, but Osiris, as you can see from the previous lore entries, has this fixation, his obsession with the darkness, with the ultimate threat that faces humanity, and his skeptical of the speaker's kind of view that they just need to stay near the traveler and that the traveler will protect them. So he spends a lot of time off studying. He actually misses some really big important moments, such as the Battle of Burning Lake and the Great Disaster, which we covered off in the previous video um, and even mentioned back then that Osiris was missing. And perhaps the worst one was the at the Battle of Twilight Gap that's coming up, where again, he is actually not present for that rather pivotal battle which puts him in like a bit of a bad stead with the speaker. The thing that actually pushes it over the edge is that Osiris, you know, starts making these predictions on what he thinks might happen based on his experiences with the with Vex technology. But a kind of like cult of personality starts to develop around him. People take his predictions as prophecies. And this all comes to a head in this comic that you can read online on Bungie's website where the speaker essentially exiles him for, for heresy, for speaking against the Traveller. Ikora and um, Osiris don't necessarily leave on the best terms. There's a tiny bit of reconciliation between them, but essentially she takes on his position as the Warlock Vanguard, but the title of Vanguard Commander actually gets passed to Zavala. Legend Saint-14, Twilight's End. He could feel his light draining. He pulled all of it into one last hope. He reeled back and bam, his helm found purchase, breaking through just above the Kel's eyes. The ether screamed from his head and together they fell to the ground. The Exo-Guardian rose, staggering back. He couldn't take his eyes off the Kel's body. He'd never seen any fallen withstand a skull puncture, but this was no ordinary fallen. He waited and waited. Ghost, his words barely audible. He heard her flash in, but had a hard time pinning her down. She was buzzing about, surveying the fallen cow. He's dead, all right. So that's it. We are done now. He removed his helm, tossed it aside, and dropped to his knees. The devils without a cow. This war was over at last. They could finally go home. We are. Get me the speaker. Opening its channel. Stand by. Is that you, my son? The speaker's voice was filled more with anticipation of news than concern. It is, father. The devil Kel Sulkis is dead. This war is over. Such courage and power, the greatest ever to brace these worlds. You bring all of us peace. 
we will light the final flare, Devil Red. They will all know what you have done. Father, I don't think I have the energy to return. I'll rest here, and come back to be honoured when I return. Of course, son. But... There is something concerning you. More fallen march on the city? No, not this time. I have word that Osiris was seen on Mercury, the Caloris Basin. He's turned his mind back to the Vex. Mercury? Too many channels to know. You activate one, you start to feed its veins. He threatens our peace. Your duty, my son. You must never forget. I cannot. The ghost killed the feed and waited for its guardian's words. Ghost, prepare my Vex arsenal and plot a course for Mercury. That old man is about to wake up hell. The Accolade, Part 2 Saint stood at the gateway into the infinite forest. Six fronts. Twilight Gap. Boyle Pass. The breaking of the weapons of rain. Other guardians always seem to remember where and when they found the engrams that revealed the most treasured pieces in their arsenals. The Galahorns and the Dark Age Antiquities. He had difficulty with that. But he could name almost every person who had awarded him an accolade of the course of his guardian career. They covered every nook of his armour. They adorned his ship, the Grey Pigeon. He had never talked about them. And, as he looked up at the yawning translucent field before him, he wished that he had. Saint Fourteen's Grey Pigeon. The name? Pigeons are the only birds left in the city sky. One of the many last things we fight for. If you have a problem with that, we could step into the crucible. Saint Fourteen. Ship's final log. Osiris. I hope whatever you find in this place is worth it. My recommendation to install you as Vanguard Commander was not a gesture to stroke your ego. It was an order to stay and help the city achieve all that it could. An order you refused to follow. News of my demise will no doubt reach you late. I can already see your response. The guilt that will follow, however fleeting. I thought you had changed after six fronts. That seeing your people on the brink of destruction and spared from death would be reward enough to stay. To fight. I'll fight in your stead one last time. Father, my duty is at its end. I've seen what the city can become. I know you can lead its people to it. To my inspiration, your final gift to me I now send back to you. It will be good to see you again. Saint Fourteen. Transient. Geppetto. 31294. Hello, Sagira, Brother Osiris. Please maintain this open communication channel. Oh, good idea. Make us a subnet. Osiris, 37294. I will miss my next rendezvous. Saint, 38294. Is that so? I suspected this would happen when your trip suddenly became longer. I will tell the Vanguard that your ship was damaged and has caused delay. Do not make me lie for you again. I do not like lying. It upsets Geppetto. Additionally, Tell Sagira that I remember her promise, and that I am owed a debt if she does not keep it. Osiris, 40294. Sagira does not gamble. Saint, 41294. It is not gambling. It is different from gambling. 
She cannot be nagging you enough. Your response time on our letters is terrible. Please, try my suggestion. I believe it will help. Osiris, 514-294 Is Ikora well? Are you? Saint, 514-294 We are both disappointed, but we will live. Father cannot defend you any longer. Osiris, 514-294 I will speak for myself, Saint. 517294 That was quite the show. Where are you? Osiris 62294 Finding answers. We will speak soon. Osiris 929296 Where are you? Flame, solar wind, the sand sweeps, weeping across a stone. It breaks on glass in keeping with its own. You were right, it helped. Searching. Somewhere, the other tiny star is calling out. You try to answer, but it cannot hear you. Not without help. You want to help, but you are paralysed. Your limbs are crushed and your heart beats so slowly. You've never known weakness so intimately as you do now. You can only wait. I am the last speaker, but I've been searching for the next. I stand on the balcony of my small apartment with Lady Ephrodite, who wishes to leave the last safe city of Earth. I suppose I can't convince you to stay. Ephrodite stands with her arms crossed, looking out over the city. No, she says. And you certainly don't need to ask permission. She laughs, just a little. No. She leans out over the balcony railing, looking down. Guardians have no fear of heights. She would probably happily hang over the rail by her ankles if the mood struck her. But I was thinking about what you said before. She turns to look at me. But the featureless mask serves me once more, betraying nothing. About finding the next speaker? Ah. I've been waiting for decades for someone to come to me, to tell me their child is having strange, blinding dreams and headaches, to see a guardian stroll through the tower, flocked by unpaired ghosts. I've interviewed hundreds of people via long-distance comms. I've consulted the traveller. I've walked daily among the crowds of civilians and guardians at the entrance of the city. And still... I've found no one I can hand down my mask to. Before Saint-14 left for Mercury, I thought that maybe he could take my place, that I might be able to teach him. That's not the way it's usually done, but he has such a gentle heart. He has the right temperament. Sometimes I think he's better suited to it than I am, but he hasn't come back. I clear my throat. Yes, I say, right. I still haven't found them. But I know they're out there. Well, Aphrodite says, I'm going out there. I can look. It's a good offer. But I'm still waiting for him to come back all the same. That's why you want to leave the city? I ask instead of condoning the proposal. You're the one who convinced me to come here. I'm glad I did, she says, lifting her chin. But no, that's not it. There's something about this life that isn't... working for me. Seems to me that a guardian should have more ways of marking this world than with a gun, 
That's not how I think of you. She pauses, then leans on the railing. Sure, she says. But it's stuck in my muscle memory all the same. Hundreds of years of pointing and shooting. Speaker, she shakes her head. I don't know what it is yet, but I want to find a different way. This conversation feels so familiar. I was so young the last time we had it. I understand, I say, softer now. That's a noble cause. She shrugs. And maybe I come back with a little baby speaker. She doesn't say it, but the if I come back at all hangs in the air between us. I would appreciate your help. I say finally. I can't wear this mask forever. Suffering. Something terrible is going to happen. In this dream, a horrible, brutal hand stretches toward you. But this is not the old enemy you know. It is something new. Something that hopes to use you more than it hopes to destroy you, but it's willing to settle for either. The cage is worse than the paralysis of silence. It is worse than the grasping tendrils of dark. It is too tangible. It is too unfamiliar. This is not why you came here. This is not what you deserve. The fear is enough to make you want to leave. I am the last speaker, and I dream that the Traveller will leave us. It shouldn't be a surprise. This truth has been passed down from speaker to speaker for generations. The Traveller is good. The Traveller is sentient. The Traveller will save us, and the Traveller will leave us. For many, many years, I believed that the prophecy of the Traveller's departure was misinterpreted and fulfilled instead by its silence after the collapse. I stopped preaching that final tenant. It only served to frighten people. My dreams, which have always been infrequent and fleeting, come more regularly. They are more confusing than ever, more disruptive. I once so rarely dreamed while awake, but now it happens all the time. I am silent again. I am gone. I leave behind a yawning void. My dreams forecast a terrible future. A future without the traveller's light. I see them all failing. Guardians and lightless alike, toppled by the traveller's absence. I don't understand why it happens, and I don't know when, but I know it is coming. The details almost don't matter. I've lived my whole life bringing people into the light of the Traveller. I've made promises and assurances all based on faith. I've crushed doubt down into myself as far as it will go, made myself sick with it, because doubt is better left unspoken. I do not recognise my world. I want to flee. It's an easy decision in the end. I tell no one. Until I can understand better what's coming, sharing this information would only be dangerous. It would create panic. A mass exodus from the city? Maybe the system, if Dead Orbit has a say in it. There will be fear and anger and violence, all based on a dream I can't explain or verify with proof. If I can understand this better, if I can make sense of it, then I can fix it, surely. So I go on, as if nothing has happened. I attend consensus meetings. I discuss hidden intelligence with Ikora, I receive reports and news from our scouts outside the city, and I consult with Zavala. People come to me with questions, as always. They ask how to cope with loss and change and fear, all daily realities of this life. 
they ask how to cope with doubt. I lie through my teeth and tell them to trust in the traveller. Empty, empty, empty. The dreams continue. The headaches get worse. But I believe so strongly that this knowledge would destroy our way of life, and I hold it so tightly that it poisons me. It's all for nothing. I'm in my apartment when I hear the first ground-shaking explosion, and I go outside to see what's happened. I see the Red Legion fleet darkening our skies, and I realise I have made a terrible mistake. Saint-14 in the Infinite Forest, covering the lore tabs from the Seasonal Weapons, finishing the web lore, the Acolyde, and also including the quests that took place during the Curse of Osiris Destiny 2 expansion. Martyr's Retribution There seems to be no end to them. No matter how many are destroyed, there are always more. An infinite, ceaselessly multiplying array of circuits and fluid. New units replace their ruined predecessors, forming out of sapphire transmat clouds. They want me dead, but they won't stop until I meet my demise. They persist. For all their vast knowledge, they seem to have one blind spot. They should know by now. I also want them dead. I won't stop either. Steel Feather Repeater. I feel the recoil of the weapon and loosen my grip. But the more I fight it, the more it fights me. I choose to let it lead. It finds the milky cores and bursts them with a satisfying combustion. Radio Larian fluid glinting in the light. It guides me as I support it. We work in tandem, a brilliant dance of destruction, leaving nothing but ruin in our wake. Nothing can stop this union. Breachlight. I find it odd, the cycle we are in. I have died many times, reborn anew, the fight pulsing through my veins. The Vex, with their minds shed, must also know this sensation. Fighting to die. Dying to fight. Over and over. I wonder what they know that I do not. Do their calculations ever have them victorious in their pursuit? We share this perpetual sequence in our encounters, yet there is no common ground outside of our mutual bloodlust. I die again. The anger rises. I fight back harder, wiping out the entire squadron of their patrolling units. More arrive. I die again, ready for my resurrection. Gallant charge. How did they find me? Every direction I turn, there they are. The beady, phosphorescent red eyes of the hobgoblin in the darkness around me. I look for cover, but more infernal machines teleport in, blocking my path. I am outnumbered. Perhaps my luck has run out. They inch closer in pairs. Two by two, they prepare to disintegrate me. There is still more for me to do. More heads to break. My weapon charges. I breathe in. I move. Line in the sand. The Vex are oppressive. Minotaurs fall over themselves to get the jump on me. I've exhausted my options. I need to use the distance to my advantage. I peer out over the rock's edge. They seem to have lost me in the scuffle. The gentle hum begins, 
and I feel my weapon charging between my hands. I take out two with the first shot, another two with the next. They scatter now, confused and irate. They seek me out desperately. All I can offer is another barrage that depletes their numbers and it creates more scrap. The last two couldn't get within ten meters of me. It's a small victory. I am alone once more. It helps to set boundaries. Perfect paradox. A tale that's different from the rest. The thread unfurls against the clocks. The one the speaker loved the best must have a perfect paradox. I never found Osiris, but I killed enough Vex to end a war. And they, in turn, a fatal blow. They completed a mind with the sole function to drain the light from me. It worked very well. Don't worry. Not that you worry much. It took them centuries to build, key to the unique frequency of my light, and I sit atop its shattered husk. I mourn that I will never reach the heights you have. To me, you represent everything a guardian can become. Yours a thriving city, so different from mine. My whole fourteenth life I fought to make my city yours. I never finished. All I have left is this weapon. The Cryptarchs say you crafted it yourself, built it out of scraps and light and sheer will, inside the infinite forge. I'll make sure it finds its way back to you. When you gave it to me, I swore I would make it my duty to follow your example. I'm still trying. Saint-14 Legends Lost Signal Light During the Curse of Osiris expansion, after the events of the Red Ball but before Forsaken, the Guardian investigates a signal coming from the Infinite Forest. I'm picking up a signal. It's faint, but it's definitely coming from the forest. Sounds like an old vanguard code. Perhaps you hear the final dreams of the lost. Uh, thanks. Very helpful. Since I can't track dreams of the lost, how about we go find that signal? The signal's getting stronger. I should be able to find the source, but there's some kind of interference. Signals tend to overlap, get mixed up with simulations. It can be hard to find what's real and what's not in here. Detecting traces of familiar light up here. Wait, Saint-14? He's been missing for decades. Saint was one of the greatest titans who ever lived. Hero of six fronts. All that power and he just vanished. The city's still looking for him. The signal's coming from a Vex Conflux, but there's something odd. The time stream around it is unstable. I don't know anything that could do that. Get me to it. Maybe we can figure this out. Saint-14 is lost in the infinite forest. It's because he came here to find us. You can't blame yourself for every missing guardian, Osiris. For him, I can. What was that? Light. The complex was holding back a rift full of light. Vex from all times, fighting together. Like they were pulled here by the rift in the time stream. A rift Saint-14 made with his light. If he still lives, then we must find him. Already ahead of you on that one. You start searching in here. We'll head back to the lighthouse and see if Vance knows anything. The first vanguard commander. The one who made the great Osiris leader of the warlocks. Saint-14! He could join us here in the lighthouse. Fight alongside you and Osiris. Turn the tide against the Vex for good. Can you imagine? You found Osiris. You can find Saint-14. 
He's got to be in the infinite forest. With him by our side, we could succeed where Osiris fa- Well, you get the idea. Yes. I have a reading on Saint 14's location. Hold on. We're coming for you. Bring you back to us, Guardian. Saint 14 is a primary source for the early Osiris years. He will be able to settle some, let's call them differences of opinion, in which one side is wrong. We'll get right on that, thanks. If Saint 14 has been lost all this time, do you think he's okay? Nothing could stop that old Exo. Probably lecturing a Vex. Titan lectures. Long speeches, occasional punching. Should be fine. This place looks inviting. Oh, yeah. You missed our first trip here. Vex are quite the decorators, aren't they? There. The signal is coming from beyond that gate. And it moved. Definitely a temporal disruption. If Saint 14 was threatened, he would attack. He would not have known how easy it is to be cast adrift in these realities. Then we'll find him and bring him home. A Minotaur? Are they trying to keep us out or him in? Both. Take out the mind, take down the gate. It's true in pretty much every reality. What happened? Vex. Thousands of them. Saint Fourteen's light. It's gone. Rest in peace, my friend. Osiris, I'm so sorry. I... I think we should leave him here. It looks like the Infinite Forest laid him to rest. Built him a... memorial. Did the Vex learn to respect him? I don't think I ever told you this, but Saint-14 was one of the first Guardians I ever met. Even before I found you. I always hoped you'd turn out like him. I wasn't disappointed. You were a good friend, Saint. Goodbye. That encryption pattern. Let me examine it. Yes. Yes! This relic you found. It once belonged to Saint-14. It has power. But not power enough to save the mighty Titan. Lost to the Vex. Alone in the infinite forest. We really do need each other. Guardian and Ghost. The followers and Osiris. In any case... It is not our charge to keep relics such as these. It is yours now. Use this as he would have. Panoptes, the infinite mind, was dead. And so was Saint-14. Osiris looked down at what remained of his friend. The infinite forest shimmered around him. The Vex had built a dais to carry the body of Saint-14. The Titan had been stripped of life. There was no obvious killing wound on his armour. Perhaps they had repaired it. Sagira ran a beam of light across the body. Saint carried these ribbons everywhere, she whispered. He called them his accolades, Osiris replied. What were they for? Osiris was quiet for a long moment. He sat, staring at the tomb. I never asked. Dawn Seasonal Story Covering a lot of web lore. We have The Sundial, Sisters, Actions of Mutual Friends, Desperate Times, and Joining. Also, the Seasonal Artifact, the Exotic Devil's Ruin, 
the main beats of the seasonal quests um, and their interactions before ending on the final entry from the Pigeon and the Phoenix. The Sundial Some time after the death of Panoptes, Infinite Mind, and the city's venture to the Infinite Forest, Osiris stepped back to look upon his work. It towered stories above him. The Sundial was complete, a shining beacon in Mercury's sky. He needed only to seal the chronometric core, which lay bare at the centre of the spire, and activate the arc conduits that ran for miles under the planet's surface. Sagira circled the superstructure, scanning every inch of it. I don't know about this, she said. I have full confidence. It's your design. That work was theoretical. If the Vanguard find out what you did to build it, if this works, the Vanguard will find out either way. Sagira darted down as if to dive bomb her chosen, but stopped just short and met him eye to eyes. I know you feel guilty, but there's no telling what will happen if you turn this thing off. He's dead because of me. I've made every precaution. I've had my echoes check against trillions of disaster scenarios. He turned to look at the fluctuating glow of the exposed chronometric core. Mercury is the only planet that will be affected. Because that's where he died. Where will this stop? Who else will you decide deserves a second chance? You know I can't make another bargain like this one. I just want to make sure you know that. Osiris blinked. She rarely spoke this bluntly, and without irony. Hey, hey, hey! came a far-off, echoing shout. No, that ain't right. The drifter came into view from behind one of the Sundial's auxiliary pylons, pointing a jabbing finger at Osiris's machine. Sagira narrowed her eye at the rogue light bearer, and lowered herself to Osiris's shoulder. Why is he here? she asked quietly. I asked him to consult on the engineering work, Osiris replied, crossing his arms. You sicko, the other man declared, walking a circle around the warlock, his eyes darting along every surface of the sundial around them. As the drifter wrapped his knuckles on the north pylon, he mumbled, Ghost, do the numbers. An armoured ghost with a red eye unfolded out of transmat and began a scan pattern on each sundial spire. Drifter walked to the central spire and put his ear up against it. This core said, leaning close. His eyes darted back to Osiris. It's whispering. Osiris's expression didn't change. His arms didn't uncross. We'll seal the core away. I understand the ramifications. Good luck keeping that contained. Not something I would bargain with, hotshot. Drifter stood up and beckoned his ghost with two fingers. It floated earthward and unleashed a holographic array of statistics along the sundial deck. The red light reflected off the drifter's eyes as he drank the numbers in. Your math checks out, he said finally as his ghost folded away. It'll work, but will you find him at the exact moment you need? No guarantees. Let me worry about that, Osiris said. Just one more question then. Why all the fuss? I owe him. I owe a lot of people, Warlock. You're open the gates of hell with a vex key. When the Traveller brought me back, I had no friends, no family. No one had anything in the Dark Age. But Saint was always there, and I saw him grow from neophyte to demigod. Drifter shrugged. We've all had to flex a little, with a gunfight or two. It's why we're still here. We all gain strength, but some light bearers never grasp a wider view of the world. They're happy to stick to their ways, languish, when they could be so much more. Drifter chuckled and spat, saluting Osiris with a single finger. I get by. Of course you do. 
I'm like you. Drifter smirked. But Saint faced his fears and failure better than any of us, and never strayed from his path. He should get a chance to walk to the end. He already did, but I'll leave you to your devices, you lunatic. The drifter turned, hands in his pockets to leave. If you short-circuit the universe, you're on your own. If I make a mistake here, you might cease to exist, Osiris replied. Maybe that wouldn't be so bad. We haven't talked about payment. If you live through this little experiment, you can be sure I'll be back to collect. Go home. There's a guardian you should meet, Osiris said. Yeah, yeah. Hero. Red War. Can't wait. A dozen echoes flanked Osiris. The sundial spun and sparked above them, around them. His echoes vanished in staccato bursts of chronometric arc. Stepping not elsewhere, but elsewhen, as the sundial fell silent. Osiris could still see and feel through them as twelve of him walked the corridors of time. Where those halls were intersected by the Vex network, his echoes hacked hobgoblins and minotaurs apart using solar swords powered by sheer will. They hid their shadows and stood still, unblinking, to avoid the network minds. Together, they pushed to corners that gave way to the Mercurian Dark Age. From there, they separated, entering myriad moments of Saint's visits to Mercury. An echo encounters a battle-hardened Saint at the mouth of Caloris Basin. Saint is a member of the Pilgrim Guard, and he and his fire team descend on the batteries of Vex Goblins, the bloom of heavy gunfire leading their way. This Saint is too early. The echo does not approach. Neither does the Echo who watches in a dark corner as Saint's jump ship lands at a lighthouse at the Caloris Spires. Its interior is cloaked in shadow. The cult of Osiris's retrofit of the structure isn't due for another age. Saint comes here to keep it clear of Vex attempting to reclaim it. He lights the darkness as he tears Minotaurs apart with solar fists. An Echo crouches on a cliffside out of sight as, far below, Saint uses his solar light to cut through the armour-plated Mercurian soil. Solitary stones line a series of holes that stretch for a dozen metres to either side. An echo hides in burning light as Saint works shoulder to shoulder with the sunbreakers to construct the burning forge. Their hammering and soldering with solar knuckles and sledges draws a silent parade of Vex to their building site. The sunbreakers take turns, stepping away from the construction to dismantle the intruders using the same solar implements. An echo spies Saint from a vantage point in the high plains of the Fields of Glass. The Titan fights for his life against purple bannered fallen, bearing the same symbol as modern Dusk soldiers. They are the House of Rain, the lowest house. The burning camp around them is curiously absent of bodies, but Saint but Osiris has heard Saint tell this story before. One of Saint's first missions for the Speaker brought him to Mercury in a failed attempt to retake that planet for humanity. They had not known at the time that the Vex had already started to transform the Garden World into a machine. House Rain followed Saint's jump ship and waited till the expedition had made camp. Then the Fallen annihilated the colonists Saint was charged to protect and beat him to within an inch of his life. The Echo lives that story first hand now, and finds himself looking away at the terraformed vegetation on his feet instead. It's already half machine, grass and metal blades growing beside each other under his boots. A catch roars down from the sky, and rains heavy munitions on the battlefield, and the Echo's vantage point fills with rolling clouds of dust. The Echo takes his leave, He's seen enough. Osiris's echoes scour Saint 14's timeline on Mercury, but the corridors of time refuse to give way to the moment they need. Saint and the Martyr Mind in the depths of the Infinite Forest. The echoes work tirelessly for weeks, then months in the space between moments. 
In desperation, he splits the dozen copies into many thousands more as the work continues fruitlessly. One Echo stays for years against Osiris' orders. He has never lost control of one before. He didn't think that it was even possible. He and the Echoes are the same. He feels this aberrant copy lose his sense of self. Another few years in, he feels this Echo press the touch of cold metal to his head. And then he feels nothing. Two Echoes wander into the corridors of time with orders not to stop. Brute force has worked for Osiris before. To this day, he can still feel them. Their search continues. The rest eventually succumb to Vex security measures where the network intersects with the corridors of time. Even Osiris' light has limits. None of the Echoes ever approaches a saint. They never find the right one. Osiris sat quietly at the base of the sundial. No time had passed since the machine's activation, but he had just lived a multitude of lives. Sagira hovered over his shoulder and asked hopefully, Did it work? The warlock stood and made his way to the southern border of the sundial. Shut it down. Wrap everything in a stealth skin. Let nothing, no one, find it. Osiris disappeared into an incandescent flame. Sagira stared at the sundial's central spire. Damn it, she whispered. Sisters. The three sisters arrived on Mercury. They searched for the infinite forest, and through it, a path to their people's salvation. A simulated future where they were free from the Cabal. Instead, they found something else. Small disturbances, said oldest, Oslet, the wisest. Little currents in this timeline. Can you see them, sister? I can taste them, said second-born Tazarok, the hungriest of her sisters. I can feel the edges. Third-born, Nerul, the quietest among them, reached her hand out to test the air. As can I, said she. And something else. The source is disguised. The technology is human, but refined. Surprisingly so. Disable it, said Tazarok, who was impatient. It is leaking. I wish to see the leak. Nerul fluttered her fingers across the sleeve of her suit. She worked for one day and one night, though the passage of time was hidden by Mercury's perpetual blinding light. All the while, she could feel the restless impatience of her sisters. A strange device shimmered into existence around them. They looked up at the length of an enormous golden spire. It whispers, said Tazarok. Then block your ears, said Oslet. Do you see the potential in this? Chaos, said Nerul. No, said Oslet. Opportunity. See how it tugs at the fabric of our time? Can you see the seams? The seams were sewn tightly shut, but a skilled hand could find them. A skilled hand could rip every stitch. All three sisters could feel it. It will take time to activate, said Nero. Someone has protected it from meddling. We will have time, said Oslek. We will open the past and change the course of Gaul's fate. Anticipate his mistakes, undercut his advisers. Why, said Tazarok. Because he could be swayed to our purposes, said Oslek. He was a fool, but he could be puppeteered, led to a more advantageous downfall. But why not go back further, said Tazarok, eager, to dash the whelp's skull in the pit before he crawls out onto a throne? Risky, said Nerul, shaking her head. 
Why not tear into the future instead and make our attack where the Guardians cannot predict it? Predictions are not their strength, said Tazarok. And yet they have built this, snapped Nirul. Sisters, Osletk said. We need it to argue. This device will let us walk through future and past both. And so we will cut the most advantageous path, wherever it may be. For hours and days and weeks, the sisters laboured over the machine. While her sisters defended her from the Vex, Nirul bent the device to their purposes and, with the force of their combined will, made it whir to life. Around them, time split along its seams. Windows into other worlds, Mercury's true past and future, opened before them. The device stood at the centre of all of it, an anchor point. And, all along the fault lines of time, where the past and present and future met, Vex were ripped in half, sliced through by a knife of pure temporal energy. They surveyed their new kingdom, a past present and future open to their manipulation. It is so clear, said Nirul, reverent. An unobstructed glimpse into what was and what will be. Not the troubled ramblings of a mad thing like the Oxer, said Tazarok. They shared the feeling of unbounded possibility and tasted the potential for success and then for failure. Together, they drank the feelings in and steeled themselves against them. The past and future are at our fingertips, sisters, said Oslet. Let us see what prospects they hold. Actions of Mutual Friends Osiris stood before a gate into the infinite forest. Two years ago, News had reached him that one of his oldest friends was dead. The saint had been missing for ages, but the warlock had always assumed that the titan would turn up someday. He was wrong. He realised he was staring through a dormant gate frame and keyed a cubicle device that hung at his belt to pry the doorway open. He couldn't save saint from the vex. But every day he stood vigil in the infinite forest to monitor simulations of the future based on their activity. Beyond the gate, a shimmering sea of data beckoned him. He stepped through, into the white moor of an infinite forest debug chamber. Start it up, Sagira, he said. Sure you don't want to take a break today? She asked, unfolding above him like a crown. The Vex won't. She considered it for a moment. Then the forest shimmered around them and the white moor dimmed to half-darkness. Then pitch black. The floor fell away and Osiris's light held him aloft, sheathed him in a thin veneer of armour. Nothing moved. The warlock frowned, lit a solar spark and held it up. It illuminated nothing around him. Did something go wrong with the sequence? I just triple checked. No, she replied. This is it. This is the simulation. He keyed his radio. Go ahead, Osiris, Ikora said. What's happening out there? He replied. Take your pick. We're at war on the moon again. The Vex attacked. And? We retaliated. The undying mind is dead. How? A plan. And mutual friends. Our mutual friends just changed all projected futures in the infinite forest. You don't sound happy about that. I'll be in touch. He cut the transmission. Where are we? He asked Sagira. Where we always are. Simulated Mercury. He couldn't even see stars. How far does this void reach? All the way to the Traveller, for all I know. Take us there. Osiris knew the simulation moved around him, but the typical shimmer of the forest was gone. There was nothing to see. Were here? she confirmed, as he found gravelly purchase under his boots. He'd never heard her sound so unsure of herself. It was brighter here, at the top of a windswept dune, but barely. He couldn't see the sun, in the purple twilight that hung above him, 
The breeze roared in his ears. The sphere of the Traveller was gone. In its place, an obsidian monolith at least twice the size dominated the sky. In the last city's place was a swirling dust storm, tinged purple by the dying light. When does this happen? The forest predictions give a window of two or three decades, depending on a multitude of variables, with a not insignificant chance for acceleration based on specific elements. What elements? Actions of mutual friends. Kill the simulation. Get me to Mercury. Speak with Ikora Ray. It's good to see you, Guardian, Ikora says, inclining her head. I was hoping I might ask for your help once again. She folds her arms behind her back. My hidden have discovered unusual Red Legion activity on Mercury, but they are unable to locate the source of it. Her brow furrows. My suspicion is that Osiris is at the centre of this, but I've been unable to contact him. I was hoping you might be able to find him. Perhaps he can help us. Un Perhaps he can help us understand what's happened. A disturbance on Mercury. The Guardian tracks Osiris down to the sundial on Mercury. Welcome to my sundial. It is a means to walk the corridors of time. And time is broken here on Mercury. I need your help. You've been busy. When you slew the Undying Mind, you changed the course of history. Inside the Infinite Forest, the Vex future I long sought to prevent was no more. Instead, I met an emptiness I'm only beginning to understand. This new future dwarfed the Vex Apocalypse. It was annihilation at the subatomic level, reaching out forever. So I left the forest, and I emerged to find that time is broken on Mercury. The Red Legion have run amok in timelines across the past, present, and future of this planet. If you're willing to help, I'll arm you to smash the Legion and collapse the timelines they've created. You'll need my sundial to do it. recovery operation. Osiris had built containment devices, the obelisks, to stop the effects of any actions he took whilst exploring and manipulating timelines with the sundial from rippling out beyond Mercury, but these have been broken and require repair as part of the seasonal journey. All that you see here was not in the sundial's original design. I built it that an ally of mine could cheat death. You and your guardian cohorts know him as Saint 14. I failed to help him, and his death remains my greatest regret. Desperate times. Chronometric emissions cut across Mercury's surface. Radiolaria steamed from fissures that erupted like open wounds in the machine soil. White blue streams of arc energy carved borders around a circular sector about a hundred miles wide. Walls of chronometric flame tore through vex spires that came tumbling down in halves and sheared minotaurs in two along the boundaries of the region. The Red Legion stood watch as these eruptions flared around every cabal machine structure and soldier inside the sector. They showed no sign of panic as ethereal fire burned over the world and their Vex opponents. Instead, they waited, watched, and mobilized purposely around the phenomenon. The circular shape that these walls cut were further segmented into three sections. Red Legion soldiers found themselves staring across the chronometric walls at each other from inside Mercury's past 
present and distant future. Under three different skies, three different suns, and on three different elevations of Mercury's gradually descending surface, the Red Legion went to work. Perhaps this time, they would win the Red War. Somewhere, deep inside the Vanguard Halls, in a secure meditation chamber, a trio of warlocks surrounded Osiris. One Praxic, one Thanatonaut, and one Vanguard. Did the Vex corrupt him? Orno wondered. My order just wants to know if he's real, or some kind of Vex simulation. An echo? Harper said, paging through a data pad in his hands. You haven't left the forest in years, Ikora said to Osiris, the only one to address him directly. I need help, Osiris replied. I know, Ikora responded, hands clasped behind her back. She stared intently at her former mentor. Back in her crucible days, that uncompromising gaze was often the last thing her opponent saw. Orno glanced sidelong at her superior. Harper coughed and looked down at his datapad. Two years ago, Guardians entered the Infinite Forest, Osiris continued. They aided me in defeating the Axis Mind Panoptes, preventing a Vex Apocalypse from befalling the system. In the process, he looked between each of them in turn. Some Guardians reported a body they found in the forest depths. Ikora sighed. Sade 14 never came back from that last mission to Mercury. We finally knew why. I reacted to it the only way I knew how. By turning Mercury into a temporal weapon for the Cabal? Orna asked. You are awfully tranquil for a man who just doomed this system, Harper said. You should rethink your career in Thanatonautics, Warlock Harper, if death frightens you so, the exile replied. He nodded at Orna. I've made mistakes. I will continue to make them. The nature of my work requires it. We should lock you away, the Praxic replied, but there was no fire in it. There are others you've allowed to roam free. These are desperate times, Orna, Osiris said. I think you know that. Harper opened his mouth to ask another question, but Ikora cut him off. Give us a minute. Orna ducked her head and Harper bristled, but both left without question. Alone with Osiris, Ikora said, The speaker was right to exile you. We all make our own choices, Osiris replied. Like the Vex gateway you built to the undying mind. A strategy like that is exactly what the machines would not expect. And you knew the Guardians would deliver. What's your point? You think like I do. But you've done what I never could. Found a way to coexist with the Vanguard while keeping their fool necks above the water, said Osiris. If you think you're helping your case, you're not. Time is broken on Mercury. I need help from our mutual friends. I know that. My hidden have scouted your sundial. The Red Legion are loose in a time rift that's localized to the past, present, and future of Mercury. She took a step closer to him, shoulders tense. If we don't contain it, it's not going to stay that way for long. The rift will expand across the system. I've created a mitigation network across Guardian space. I'm in control. You are anything but... Saint deserved another chance. So did Cade. So did everyone we lost in the Red War. We'll hunt the Cabal across every timeline they create within the Sundial. They'll never be able to exploit it. You're damn right. Because you're going to mobilize the Guardians. You're going to fix this. And then you and I are going to have a long talk. Mercury should be the least of your worries. Excuse me? Let's save it for the long talk. This is where your work begins. Gain access to the sundial. 
Acquaint yourself with the timelines the Red Legion have wished into existence. Their ambitions should alarm you. Erase this history, Guardian. The Red Legion will use it as a pathway to their ideal future. The Traveler in pieces. Humanity doomed. The Cabal have always sought Vex technology. It is only logical that the forest would draw the Legion's interests eventually. I should have foreseen this. This is Mercury's past, re-envisioned. The Cabal wish to destroy the Infinite Forest. Its many realities are a threat to their ideal future. You must keep them out, Guardian. I have overseen too many useful experiments in the Infinite Forest to lose such an important testing ground. You've done well to ensure it remains open. To rewrite history is to rewrite the future. And the Red Legion want that more than anything. A world where the Red War was humanity's end, instead of a new beginning. By the time I left the city, many believed my practices to be sacrilege. But my methods have prevented countless futures, not unlike the one you walk now. When it is laid out before you, would you not sacrifice anything to see this future shut? Despite the preservation of their forces in this reality, I hear no mention of Gaul within their communication channels. The Flayers sought to win the Red War, yes, but also to usurp the Legion's leadership. To what end? Detached from time. Osiris accepts a strange object and examines it. In his hands, it flickers in and out of existence, an ever-fluctuating presence. Strange, he says, looking up to meet your eyes. An object like this has never emerged from the sundial before. His brow crinkles with concern. I fear this is evidence of how drastically the Red Legion has corrupted time on Mercury. He sets the object aside. Give me some time to study this. I may be able to determine what it is or where it came from. Meanwhile, the Obelisk Network could still use your help. He reaches for something and then presents it to you. A strange lantern. It glows faintly. This will help you in the battles to come. The Lantern of Osiris. A beacon through time. I created the sundial to rectify my greatest regret. I failed. And now the Red Legion has turned my failure to catastrophe. Time is broken on Mercury. It has taken all my resources, all my echoes, to monitor the time streams the Legion has created on Mercury. So this lantern is yours now. To light your way from time to time. May it serve you better than it served me. Osiris. Phased through time. Osiris is holding the phased object you pulled from the sundial. It continues to flicker in his hands, both material and immaterial at once. Guardian, he says, inclining his head. The most I've been able to determine about this object is that it's been pulled out of a different timeline. Right now, it's existing in two places at once, making it extremely unstable. He seems intrigued by the object and turns it over in his hands, studying it. With your help, I think I can stabilize it, at least temporarily. That way, we may be able to determine exactly what it is and why it's here. A timely discovery. Osiris welcomes you back to the sundial. The phased object, previously unstable and unrecognisable, has been transformed into the incomplete frame of a weapon. Strangely enough, Osiris says, showing you the object, it appears the object you found is some kind of weapon. A shotgun, I believe. He sets the strange frame aside and turns back to face you. There is a light signature associated with this weapon, but it's erratic. I 
can't identify it, as it's still shifting between timelines. I believe I can anchor it in the present, but I'll need data. He gestures to you. Perhaps you can help me with that as well. Corridors of Time, Part 1 The Guardian enters the Corridors of Time in search of Saint-14. The shotgun you crafted in the Infinite Forge is reacting to the sundial. An onboard transponder is broadcasting coordinates, a path through the sundial, crossing two time periods. The prophecy blueprint you used to create the perfect paradox must have included this broadcast. If you can open up the initial chamber, I can align us to the first time period the broadcast is referencing. This is new. Topographical scan confirms this is Mercury circa the Dark Age. Incoming signal on an old emergency band. Hold on. I repeat, this is Saint-14. The Fallen have overrun Zephyr Station. If you can hear this, turn back. Saint, hold your position. You have an armed guardian incoming. Who is this? Just stay alive, Titan. Samar, are you fit to fight, Titan? I was supposed to protect these people. I should be dead. You're stronger than you think. Not strong enough. What is this? The perfect paradox, built by my guardian out of spare parts and light and sheer will to aid you. It's beautiful. I probably shouldn't be showing you this, but when has that ever stopped us? This is the last safe city. During the day, there are children laughing in the streets. When night falls, the people sleep in their homes. Not against the walls, weapons in hand, like the early days. Like my people. These are your people, Saint. They're descendants. If you quit the fight, 
Maybe you'll live forever. Your ghost will protect you no matter what. But this last city might never happen. Everything I've ever built has died. I've buried most of the people I've met. I, I can't do this. Not anymore. We all make our own choices. Good luck, Titan. Okay, let's check the tower databases to make sure we didn't just wreck the entire timeline. Querying Saint-14. Records state he was a former commander of the tower. He vanished on a final mission to Mercury in search of the exiled warlock Osiris. Well, those are the big beats. Timeline intact. Good job, Saint. But our trip's not over. That broadcast I picked off the perfect paradox marked one more set of coordinates within the sundial. Returning from the past. Osiris greets you with a fire in his eyes you've never seen before. You met Saint-14 on Mercury? That was his first off-world mission for the Speaker. Those fallen were House of Rain, the lowest of their clans. House Dusk took their colours during the Red War. I... He speaks quickly. Nervously. He shakes his head. You mentioned two coordinates broadcast from the perfect paradox. He nods eagerly at you, but his mind is clearly elsewhere. The sundial is spent but it only needs time to recharge. I'll alert you when it's ready for another jump. Completing an impossible task. Saint's Ghost. The Vex transponders you've planted have detected a network signal at the pools of luminance at the system on Nessus. Kill enough of you to end the war. And you took my light. I guess that makes us even. What are you waiting for? Last words? Finish it, you cowards. Corridors of Time, Part 2. The Guardian returns to the Corridors of Time once again to try and change. Saint Fourteen's fate. Now where are we? Let's see. Topographical readouts match near present Mercury. This is before I found you. And after Saint Fourteen launched his last mission to find Osiris. Guardian, you're back. Just in time. I was about to send my ghost away. I'm afraid that Martyr Mine has taken my light. But now that you're here, these facts are doomed. time, my friend. I've chased your memory for centuries. You should go now. Those who could kill me are dead. You've made sure of that. And what if the Vex take your light again? Impossible. It cost them everything to build the Martyr Mine. When you crushed it, they were doomed. You want us to leave you? You'll be stuck here for years. You've both done plenty. Just open the infinite forest gate. I'll meet you the long way around, at the end. Ooh. 
What's a few more years of fighting Vax? Open the gate. The Guardian opens the door on Mercury. If we did this right, Saint should be waiting for us in the forest. Let's hope he's still alive. journey's end. The Guardian returns to share the news of Saint XIV's return with Osiris. I didn't think it was possible. I had given up. I spent lifetimes looking for Saint. A dozen of my echoes lost their minds before I retired them. Part of me wishes you were there to see it to feel what I felt when I surrendered. But then where would we be? What you've done today, this is amazing. Saint will need your help. The world has changed since he last walked free. In his youth, he talked often about the Guardian who inspired him. I should have guessed it would be you. A hero's welcome. The Guardian welcomes Saint-14 to the last city. Look at this place! I cannot believe what this city has become! To be home again. To hear of the Red War. See the scars. So much has changed. I was not here when the city needed me more. But regret does not serve us. We must look to the future. We must find hope again. There is no more time to waste. On my journey here, I wondered how the city could best use me. Now I think I know. Together, we will shine brighter. We will build a beacon to call all who are lost home. You will fight, and I will build. But for now, my skull needs rest. I've come to expect great things from you, Guardian. You never wavered when the tower fell when Cain died. I rely on you when all else fails, but this, rectifying the past, I could not expect. Today you saved the life of a Titan, no more, no less, and for that, I'm grateful. He might not say it to your face, but Saint idolizes you. He'll need your help to reacclimate it to you. 
all of this. Do what you can. Let's hope your journey to help Saint doesn't have any unintended consequences for our timeline. Even the Warlock Orders don't fully understand the ramifications. The Speaker exiled Osiris for less. But I know you'll stop at nothing to right or wrong. Eris says that Guardians are bound to lives of loss. We don't usually get to see our old friends again after they've passed. So thank you for this. Just try not to make this a habit. A lost relic. You've pulled a new time lost frame out of the shattered timelines within the sundial. Although you can't identify the weapon yourself, Saint-14 thinks he can help you discover its origin. Osiris told me about the strange weapon you found in the sundial. I might be able to identify it. Saint-14 takes the weapon frame from you, holding it as if it is something very precious. This, he says looking up from the frame, was used during the Battle of Twilight Gap. That battle was one of the moments that helped define what we, as a city, stand for. He hands the frame back to you. The people of the last city came together as one to fight that battle. Guardians and Lightless alike, if you could repair this, we would recover an important piece of our history, a symbol of what it means to be a guardian. He considers the frame in your hands, thinking. Perhaps in the ruins of Twilight Gap, you could recover the materials to return this weapon to its former glory. A tour through history. The Guardian heads to Twilight Gap in search of materials required to rebuild Devil's Ruin. Welcome to Twilight Gap, the place where humanity nearly died. Guardian, there are no crucible matches scheduled for the Gap today. Osiris, how did you know we were here? I saw the Guardian arrive. You're spying on him? I watch all Guardians of Stature. The battle against the Fallen that took place here, it made Titans famous. Not in a good way. You say that like the Warlocks and Hunters sat on their hands. Get off this line, Osiris. I'm showing the Guardian something very important. Make me. <laughs> you would not survive that, but you made me laugh. You can stay. The fabled Yalahorns of legend were constructed from the armor of guardians who died here. Final deaths, all of them. What happened here wasn't your fault. Or mine. We would have lost if not for Shaxx's last stand. With Nkechi and Abdi, and Truth, Lifeng, Anna, they all believed in him. He's more stubborn than you. I have never known him to give up, ever. <sighs> He's taught me a lot. Guardian, whether you wanted it or not, you've become the best of us. Or close to it. Without you, there would be no Saint-14. The Battle of Twilight Gap might have been lost. Saint, your ego knows no bounds. And you have a fat head, Warlock. What's all this? Guardian, there are no sanctioned matches at Twilight Gap right now. That's exactly what I was saying. Osiris! Warlord Shags, as I live and breathe. Saint-14? I thought you were dead. Brother, I have always hated you. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be at this for a while, Guardian. Feel free to move about the universe. I'm sure you have better things to do than listen to this. Shags, the Crucible. What have you done with it? It's not the Crucible by which you and I were forged. Took years. But Twilight Gap changed everything. 
After that day out there, the Crucible went from a place where we settled our differences to a place where we bettered ourselves. I heard you give out some amazing weapons to your fighters. Those weapons are earned with blood, sweat, and tears. Are you sure your fighters are bettering themselves or chasing hardware? Listen, even Guardians need to get paid once in a while. <laughs> when you put it that way, you sound like that sad, lonely rat man who lives downstairs. The Drifter. Keep your enemies close, right? Watch him for us. I was shocked to see Eris Mord again. She is not as she was. She represents the best of us. Ghostless. And stronger than you and me both. Perhaps we could get her a bigger gun. She would not have to carry that rock all the time. Speaking of guns, uh, tell me more about these weapons you've crafted. I am not allowed to earn them. I have heard you made one for young Redrix. Uh, Redrix is Claymore? Broadsword. Whatever. There was a hand cannon as well. You made one for Yosef. Uh, Luna's howl. Yes, Luna was his dog. She passed on the moon, fighting Hive. Those bastards. I'm glad you killed their king. Are these questions leading anywhere, Saint? Yes. The long rifle you designed, the Revoker, what's the story behind it? What does it do? It shoots bullets, Saint. It's a gun. Uh, all the good work you've done, the city is amazing, the tower is amazing. Anything I've done pales in comparison to what our Guardian has accomplished. I always told you he would return to save us. Still wearing that spinfoil hat, I see. The Guardian saved you with Vextech. He is not a divine savior. <laughs> Want a bet? Oh, you never change. And you still owe me Glimmer. In my defense, you were dead. And I don't make much as Crucible Handler. You know, when I walk the streets of the city, the children demand I carry them. I do so, but I ask them to sing me a song. A song of their people. No, I refuse. Then you can pay me. A titan is only as good as his word. But I don't know any songs. Make something up. Let me see. Eris hummed a few bars on the moon. How did it go? I'm on the moon. It's made of cheese. That is awful. It's not my song. It's Eris's. Devil's Ruin. Press on. The devils will rue the day they came to our doors. Lord Shanks. There is a reason we fight. It is not simply the thrill of battle. There are those who depend on us to stand up, hold the line, and defend what we hold dear. The battle for Twilight Gap remains the hallmark for our fortitude and a prominent reminder that nothing we do is easy. I recall Shanks defiantly ignoring Saladin's orders to fall back, driving his fire team to a final push on the wall of the last city. It ended up providing the momentum we needed to save the city, but also splintered bonds between the titans. Perhaps I can help suture these wounds now that I have returned. Even so, our memories are flooded by moments of pain, duress, and strife. Use them. Wield them. Channel them through you. Carry a piece of this battle with you. While this will never replace the mighty Gallowhorns of old, glory comes in all sizes, and we can still celebrate the victory at the Gap with munitions such as these. It is more than a gun. It is a symbol. Each component of this weapon represents a sacrifice made for the greater good. May it bring you the strength to prevail when all looks lost. Should the city ever come under threat again, 
you'll be ready. Exploring the corridors of time. Pay respects. At the end of a community puzzle, the Guardian discovers their own grave and hears Saint Fourteen's eulogy for themselves. Thank you for coming. We've gathered here today to celebrate the life of my mentor, my inspiration. They called him Crota's end. The Hyde King, Kingslayer King. The Young Wolf. Hero of the Red Wall. The man who avenged Kate Six. He had a hundred times I cannot recall. And he died doing what he does best, defending the last city of humanity. Ages ago, he saved my life, and then inspired me to save myself. I am glad that he did, because the rather held us, he is gone. Joining the three oldest sisters, Oslet, Tazarok, and Nirul, gathered around Amtek, the youngest. They spoke in harmonizing tones, each voice the pluck of a different string on the same instrument. You know our purpose, said Oslet. This crumbled timeline will let us right the wrongs of Gaul the Abdicated, said Tazarok. And thus see our people reborn, said Nirul, loosed from our fetters. I know your purpose, said Amtek, who was the most beloved. She trembled in their massive presence. The three oldest sisters had begun the process of joining, known only to them through ancient texts of the mind, never accomplished in recent memory. It was a permanent metaconcert. An unbreakable bond of self-dissolution. Already their minds had begun to merge, and Antek could see them being drawn closer, as if by some magnetic force in their bones. Then you know, said Oslet, the consequences of our failure, said Nirul. Antek nodded. Her eye darted from sister to sister, now both more foreign and more familiar, as each sister was each other sister somehow, combined. Together, we are stronger, said Tazarok, than any threat that may challenge us, said Oslek. But should we fail? Unlikely though it is, said Tazarok. You must succeed where we could not, said Oslek. And so, you will join with us. In mind, said Nirul, but not in body, said Tazarok. Already, Amtek could feel the power of their minds. Their mind settle against the edges of her own like a heavy, flat stone. And so our failure, 
said Nero. Will be your failure, said Ozlek. And our revenge, said Tazarok. Will be your revenge, said Ozlek. Amtek had hoped since the beginning to join her sister in mind and body on the battlefield of time. She had thought today they would ask. But she knew that if she felt it too keenly, they would taste her disappointment, and she craved their love. I understand, she said, and she vowed to see that any threat that would harm her sisters would be annihilated so thoroughly that it would be wiped from living memory. One final obstacle, Guardian. Crush this flare and break the Legion's hold here. Collapse this existence. Whatever plans they had are rubble now. I will see what intentions I can decipher from the ruins. Well fought. This path has been walked before. I remember sitting in a sea of stars soaked in meditation. I reached out and chose a tiny gleam of light that ruptured and bled. It burned away each atom of my being as the light ran, scorching a trail into my skin. It was but one fate set in motion, one that I was certain could not be brought to finality. Each time I traced that line in my mind, attempted to follow its probability to its logical end, it faded. Each time, until now. There are omens I have ignored in my haste to pursue my own agendas. This experience has brought clarity, Guardian. You have my thanks. Bright future. After defeating Inotam, the Guardian returns to Osiris one last time. Sagira asked me to thank you for cleaning up another of my messes. Obviously, I don't see it that way. All that happened with the Sundial was necessary to achieve this outcome, including the return of Saint-14. What you've achieved here on Mercury, I'm only beginning to believe. The future I saw in the Infinite Forest, when all this began, the subatomic annihilation of this reality, perhaps you've prevented it. I pray that you have, because no hero or weapon could defeat that emptiness. Go. Run your strike missions, your crucible training. Live your life while you can. Reunion. Saint-14 watches vessels dip in and out of the hangar. The cadence of docking and disembarking ships finds rhythm in the busy city. It is routine, practiced, peaceful. A visitor steps aboard the Grey Pigeon. Geppetto turns to welcome them. Greetings, Brother Osiris. You are a welcome sight. Is Sagira with you? Hello, Geppetto. Sagira visits Ikora. Osiris sits on the gangway of the Grey Pigeon. He runs a ribbon through his fingers. Hello, Saint. Osiris, I wondered if this meeting would be with one of your projections. I would not. Quite the shrine they've made for you. Are you dying? Saint-14 laughs. It is good to see you again, brother. 